Oh, hi there. You just caught me blocking a bunch of Muslim trolls on Twitter uh, who are suggesting that somehow I got demolished in the most recent debate. Um, yeah, hope you guys are doing well. I'm doing uh, pretty good overall. One of the questions I get a lot uh, is, hey, how do I do the types of things that you do? Or what would it take for me to get a, a spot, you know, a guest spot on the line or the hang up? Uh, or the Sunday show or any of the shows like that. And there's been a number of different answers over the year. Back when I was with the atheist community of Austin, it was the producers and the, and the individuals who were on the show, who were also often producers would get together to discuss, you know, who we want to bring on, what move do we want to make? And, uh, it was great because it gave us the opportunity to have a variety of different voices. Not everybody needed to look the same or sound the same. Um, and we didn't have to all agree on everything. We agreed on most things, but we didn't have to agree on absolutely everything. And it gave me a chance to get voices in that other people hadn't heard. I, I remember walking in um, and somebody was sitting there at the ACA talking with some other people. And it became immediately obvious to me, it, just my opinion, other people can disagree, uh, that this is somebody who really needed to be listened to. That not because they were an expert in philosophy, they weren't, they weren't an expert in anything, but they were uh, a, a decent person asking the right questions that some of us who maybe get bogged down in the weeds don't always ask. Uh, I, when I did uh, work with Pangburn and did tours with uh, Sam Harris and and Dawkins and others. One of the deals that I made was, okay, I will do these events. Um, I don't think either of us, I don't think Sam or I actually benefit from either one of us promoting the other because people already know who we are and every, you know, in an order of magnitude, people, more people don't know who Sam is. So I benefited more, but I was like, if I'm going to do these, I want to do other events as well. I want to get uh, people who don't look like me or people who don't get to be listened to, uh, to do those events. And we did some events like that. And I'm, I'm very happy with that. Now I got my own shows. Uh, I don't have to answer to any, well, it's not true. I do kind of have to answer to, you know, me and Jimmy and Arden, but the, the three of us kind of make decisions together here for <coughs> my, my show. Um, but the fun thing is, is that I get to bring on people from time to time who are my friends, and many who are experts at a certain area where I am dangerously ill-informed, uh, even though I'm still probably better informed than the people who are calling in to object with and, and, and argue with me. Uh, that's a nice spot to be in where people who are calling in um, who disagree probably generally know and understand the subject not quite as well as I do. But I always like it when people understand things better than I do. And I like finding and meeting new people. So how do you get to be a guest on one of my shows? Well, first of all, don't message me. One of the things I've witnessed over and over again, uh, including some people who became good friends of mine, are individuals who, from my perspective, are, are about becoming internet famous and not having a real job. Matter of fact, literally one of them said, Hey, we could do this and this and this, and then we wouldn't have to get real jobs. And I'm like, I have a real job and I do this. This is a mission. It, it becomes the, the process of chasing down the algorithm and getting clicks is a necessary evil, I suppose. Uh, but I also there, I have some former friends who are absolutely fraudulent, awful individuals. That's not relevant to tonight. That's just me rambling. Tonight's guest, I don't know, kind of. We spoke for the first time literally 30 minutes ago um, when we were prepping for the show. And what happens is I watch a lot of YouTube, but I don't watch a lot of atheist content. Most, If you go watch my YouTube playlist, you're going to find uh, a lot of snake and reptile content, a lot of um, only connect and other quiz show type things, lots of videos about gaming. Um, educational videos, how to do this, how to do this, this sort of build project, because I, I like to do stuff and I, I like to learn stuff. And so there's not a lot of atheist or secular content in my playlist. I have friends, both atheistic friends who are involved in, in, in the larger 
secular community. And I have Christian apologist friends, some of whom I've debated, uh, some of whom I have had heated debates with. Um, and I don't sit around watching debates. And when I'm preparing for a debate, I don't go look up my opponent. I didn't have to look up. Now, the debate that I did Saturday, I knew who Daniel was because I'd watched him debate in person when I'd been there before. But I couldn't tell you anything about him personally. Somebody came in and said that um, there was a, a evidently some sort of tragedy in his family. I'm not going to go into detail. I don't know if it's true. I don't. It doesn't matter to me whether it's true or not. But they were trying to use that to say that this tragedy in his family is why he is the way he is. I don't know why people are the way they are. And it's not my job to psychoanalyze them. But I love the fact that there is a, a growing community. Um, I wish it were more diverse. If you want to get on a show like this, the best thing you can do is just start doing the work. If, it's, if you're out there creating content um, and the algorithm puts it in front of me and I like it, um, you might get an invite. That's what happened with today's guest. So I'm going to bring him on, let him introduce himself a little bit, talk about uh, his path. We're going to talk a little bit about his path uh, from religion to secularism, what's going on with the channel, how that took, lots and lots of questions. I know that you guys have questions as well. If you're a theist preparing to call in, uh, please do. I, I would love nothing more than to have nothing but theistic callers tonight and on the Sunday show and, and everywhere. Um, but if you're an atheist caller who wants to hear perhaps a slightly different perspective or hear from somebody new on some of these issues, now is your, your big opportunity because tonight we have Brandon from uh, Mind Shift Skeptic. And I watched probably, I don't know, this, this might end up giving him slightly a big head, but uh, we're, 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 we're going to become friends or, or enemies one or the other before too long. I watched about three to five minutes of one video that he put up. And between the fact that the, the audio video production was fine, I mean, it's, it's great, but the content is what matters. And he said things in a way that made me say, hmm, who, who the heck is this guy? So welcome, Brandon, <laughs> Mind Shift Skeptic. Who the heck are you and how did the algorithm stick you in front of me? Uh, by pure fate. What an introduction. Thanks, man. I'm really excited to be here with you. And, uh, you know, you said you wanted us to get uh, to get people on that weren't like you, but we're both beard, bald, and purple yeah. tonight. So um, we'll yeah, see. We're how wearing it goes. the same color shirt, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's see. I I don't know how I got in front of you. I just started, so I am at again the mercy of YouTube. I've been making videos now for four months, and I love doing it. I still have a full time job. That's never going to change. I am doing it similar to you. I think I've got a real passion for for helping people. And uh, I was lucky enough, that's how I see it, to be in all the right positions to finally deconvert. And it took 30 years to get there. And I'd love to just shorten that for other people. So that's really the, the simple mission. We can definitely get into all the backstory, but yeah, I'm glad to be here. Well, let's, let's do that then, because I, I, you know, I remember walking down the aisle at the age of five at a revival. Um, in a Baptist church with my folks, what was your introduction to religion? What type of religion? And what was your introduction like? Uh, well, I was born on the mission field in a uh, Central American country uh, during the 80s, during a civil war down there. So that was, you know, just birthed right into medical missions. My uh, parents were both down there. We were there for 10 years. I was pretty small still when we moved back. And when we came back, my mother became the missions director of an Assemblies of God church. So I was plugged in immediately, uh, you know, mm. church four to five days or nights a week, sometimes both uh, involved in every extracurricular that was Christian themed that one could be in. And uh, yeah, in terms of those first moments, like you walking down an aisle at five, I, uh, I remember very clearly being in my sister's bedroom saying the sinner's prayer, even though my mother had assured me just from everything I was around, I was already saved, but we, we needed to make it official. So. That was my earliest memory of some kind of process or decision or acceptance, whatever you want to call it. It's kind of strange. So you're at this spot where your mother's assuring you this, and yet you're still going to go through and say the sinner's prayer. And I think it was slightly different, and this may be a different, but a difference between you know Baptist and AOG Pentecostal 
other Protestant denominations is when I walked down the aisle at five, I, my parents, I didn't learn about this until after I was an atheist, but they came to tell me about how they went to talk to, to the pastor to say, is, is this real? Can a five-year-old understand this? And the pastor's response was basically, well, you have to just wait and see. And, uh, and I, I thought that was a, a good answer rather than saying, oh yeah, right off the bat, you know, yes, your five-year-old is now welcome in the kingdom of heaven and his, his, his name's been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Um, it's a good answer. To tell them you no kind of watch. It was a good idea. Yeah, it's, it's a good answer because no one can nail down the age of accountability. And, uh, and then you get to be set up the rest of your life rededicating yourself every Sunday just to be sure. So yeah, good answer, but also pretty harmful, I think, to the psyche of a young child. Um, although I guess it was shared with your parents. Yeah, I don't know. Was, uh, my mother probably was just doubling down, you know. That that was um that was my teenage years was um I'd go to Camp Windermere in the Lake of the Ozarks with all of the other teenagers and it was a it wasn't quite if for people who I've talked about it before, people who haven't who have seen Jesus Camp, it was very much like that only without the politics at the time. Um the notion of propping up a a picture of the president and having people stand around and pray about it wouldn't have happened in in my summer camp. But what did happen is exactly what Brandon was talking about, where there's this constant process of rededicating your life. There is a guilt cycle that is involved with you're a human being, which means you're a flawed thinker and you are a flawed creation and God's given you over to a reprobate mind and your uh, lustful thoughts, your, your uh, sinful thoughts, those are the things that are gonna stand in the way you may be saved, but you may be struggling. You may be saved, but you may be backslidden. You may be saved, but you may not be living and walking with Christ you know, throughout all of this. And it, 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 the, the process is one of where they convict you and beat you down, and you're there with a bunch of other people. So that's, that's a nice thing at, at camp is everybody's rededicating their life. Everybody's crying. Everybody's like, oh, yes, I did do something wrong. I did have, you know... Uh, these other things and so that was the the cycle um when well do you remember the, at what point like you first had started having real doubts i mean all of us have doubts at different times i remember a asking questions and getting answers but do you remember when the when the answers started getting less satisfying yeah um and then what's embarrassing is how quickly i put it away for another decade but uh i actually just kind of went through this I was going through a lot of my old journals and I found one from the time that I was engaged. I got married at 21. And I think sometimes life events will kind of force you to like relook at things. And here I am getting married and I'm marrying a, uh, a woman of the same faith. And I wrote in my journal all the issues I had. And it was the first time that even being willing to write them down would have felt so blasphemous, right? And that's how I know I was at least at some precipice because I was willing to write them down and, and confront them. They're probably things I thought of five or 10 years before that. Um, so that was the first time. And then I put it all down for another eight to 10 years probably, and could not have been more in, in the interim. It's just amazing the cognitive dissonance. It is, um, I, I remember a part of it is a lack of understanding and education. I was, um, I'm a reasonably intelligent guy. I'm a fairly quick learner, but I'm not well credentialed and, or necessarily well formally educated. Um, I almost didn't graduate from high school mainly because I skipped and slept through classes and just didn't do anything for a good chunk of at least a whole year. And, uh, but I did manage to actually graduate, but that didn't leave me with a lot of options. And I, it was, I was fine not having options because I didn't have any goals. Um, the people in my church were, and my parents were convinced that God wanted me to be a preacher. I desperately did not want to do that. I, I believed, but much like Moses, I was, well, in my case, I was terrified of public speaking, whereas Moses just was embarrassed about his speech impediment. But it, it struck me repeatedly, no, 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 there's something else God wants me to do. There's something else God wants me to do. And that was the rationalization I had to disagree with virtually everybody. I remember I did a debate here in Austin at Austin Baptist Church, and members of my old church, who I hadn't heard from in decades, uh, showed up at that debate, and one of them specifically asked a question about this. 
Uh, you know, like we thought you were all going on to great things for the Lord. What happened? And so this notion of this is my life. I have my doubts and concerns, but let me set that aside. Uh, is for you, do you think it was more about the the status maintaining the status quo, maintaining acceptability, or just there's a door here that I'm afraid to open for fear of what is on the other side of it or something yeah, else? I, I think it's a combination. One, I could not conceptualize of the fact that this God did not exist. It had to be me. I had to have gotten something wrong. Okay, I'm, I'm seeing these doubts. I'm seeing these issues with the Bible. I've heard this, but still, it's not like I'm going to become an atheist. I mean, I remember even in the early parts of deconverting, I would tell my wife like my fears and doubts and I'd be like, but I'm not going to become an atheist. Like it, it was such a outside the realm of possibility um, idea for me that that was part of it. Fear was another, especially going into a marriage like, man, this is my whole life now. This is, you know, my, my friends, my family, the people I've surrounded myself upon. And, and then some of it too was maybe just insecurity, right? Like, there were so many people that were smarter, so many people that were older. I had so many spiritual mentors in my life, so many brilliant people that I knew were sane, logical, rational, pragmatic individuals that also believed in this God. Like, who was I to question? And mm -hmm. uh, enough of those things put together will just squash it, not to mention all the indoctrination and echo chambers and everything else that messes with um, an otherwise rational mind. So I don't know. And, and the most interesting thing is all those things I wrote down, it's, it's so funny. Over the next eight years, I became some of the like biggest defenders of, you know, if, if I had a problem with God's morality in that journal with a few specific examples from the Old Testament, I was the foremost preacher in my friend group about why that didn't matter and how things changed with the covenant of Jesus and uh, and really what it was trying to show us and the metaphor over the literalism. And and so it it catalyzed me into a position of being able to feel like I had to defend the things I was most scared of, which I, I think a lot of people probably do. It's uh now I, I get, I get that it's difficult sometimes to put a timeline on this for some people, they know, you know, day, day and moment, like, like we used to know chapter and verse from the time that you unshelved those doubts until you just said, Holy crap, I'm an atheist or whatever the, the 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 moment was like that how long was that period of time probably about three to four years best i can tell you know and i say that and then i go back and i see um like something i wrote for my son when he was two which would have been like two and a half years ago and i'm like oh, how did i still even how was i still holding on to this i thought i was so much past that so it is such a process mm. with peaks and valleys and kind of like re-leaning in and then really re leaning out um, before it all fell apart. So that process is what's insane. And that's, you know, again, kind of what led to me doing the channel is there's got to be a more concise way. There's got to be a system of arguments or understanding that you can put in front of someone, which I know is impossible and naive. But the struggle I had for four full years is it's insane. And that's that's how long it took me. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, the, the naivete that uh, that you mentioned um, was shared by me in the sense of when I first started doing this stuff, when I first got involved, even before I was doing the atheist experience and I was just mostly writing for online sites and, and honing um, my thoughts and arguments and trying to, trying to sort through stuff because uh, there were, there were moments where it was like, I, I have to be wrong. And, and not only, and then I realized, well, if, if I don't have a position on this, I can't be wrong. But you could still be wrong. You you could be like, I, I don't think there's enough evidence for the to believe in a God. And you could be wrong. There could be sufficient evidence to warrant it, and you are not seeing it, you are not finding it, you have some bias or some something in your way. And that was a long time. I think one of the I was already an atheist doing the show when I had um a moment. I have um one of one of my uncles it was generally viewed as the most spiritually wise person in the family. He was a a medical doctor and a medical missionary. Um, he was the one I would generally go to if I, you know, outside of the church and my parents, if I had a question about something deeper theology, something beyond the, you know, I, I, the simple questions that, that we would all ask. And I remember at the time when I was 
really working my way out uh, and didn't realize that I was on my way out. I went to him to talk to him about morality and or I went to him to talk about convincing my roommate who was an atheist uh, because I was like, I, if, if I die now and I get to heaven and God's going to be like, you literally lived with a, an atheist who was like a brother to you. Why didn't you do your duty? Why, why didn't you open the door for the Holy Spirit for, to convict him so that he doesn't end up in hell? You, you didn't do what I told you to do. And so I set out to do what I thought God wanted. And my uncle just looked at me and was like, well, you, you got to address where his morality comes from. Without God, there's no you know, concrete, absolute standing or foundation for morality. And I was so ill-informed and so generally biased in favor of awe of this person, my, my uncle being the spiritual wise one, that I just went, wow, that's brilliant. I didn't, I didn't think about it for like, I, I didn't think about it for a second. It was like he said it and my brain went, Dun, 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 there's your answer. And then I went back. But before I ever had a conversation with my roommate, um, I was like, I need to really get a good understanding of this. And so I went out to study specifically that. And that was key to my falling away. And the, I'd say the final nail in the coffin of any nerves I had about talking about this stuff with anybody is that same uncle called me one day when he found out I was an atheist, found the show. And I was like, oh my gosh, here's gonna, this is the real challenge. I'm going to go head to head with, you know, what in my mind had been built up as a, a, a brilliant philosophical Bible minded, you know, and, and what I got was Pascal's wager. Mm. And I and was you're like, wow, was how did I waste work. so much time? I was at work and I'm like, I have overprepared for this conversation. Is anybody going to come with anything better than that? Um, for you, when you, know, you, had the, you had this three-year period or something before you get to the point where you're just identifying this way and you're, you're working in the channel, um, I, I don't know, you know how much you've done in the way of live conversation with people, but of course you had conversations with your wife. You've had conversations with other people. How is it dealing with family members that you know, they know you as a Christian. I, I, there's no reason to tell my stories again, so I'll stop telling my stories. But how, how was it for you, and how did you, how did you balance that? How did you come to grips with it, or are you still doing it? Definitely still doing it. You know, the coming out process is another thing that's kind of near and dear to my heart that I want to help people through because it's it's your whole life, and I think that people can handle it poorly. Um, that create unnecessary additional suffering for them and and the people that they're telling because you have to understand where they're coming from as well. I mean, I really, it's, I mean, telling my wife was obviously the hardest. Telling my mother was probably the second hardest. I mean, she is the most fundamentalist uh, version of a Christian that, that you can have. Even when I was going down the slippery slope of progressivism, you know, that was terrifying to her. And so arriving on the other side was becoming Satan incarnate. Um, so those conversations are, are still happening um with different people as the the circle kind of goes out you know you start with your family and your best friends and then acquaintances and people you used to know and um it's always hard even telling my friends was harder than i thought my, my i have two best guy friends and they both cried uh they both said they felt like they lost a brother and it's it's an unnecessary thing that you and i can see like there's there's no reason like everything else is still there i'm still me but there's that commonality that that ran so deep that uh that you really can't replace with something else when someone else still believes like that you know i have yet to have anyone in my life also deconvert um i can only imagine what that's like when they're like oh wow sorry and then you can kind of come together on that on uh on how you both used to think and and, and why it didn't work and why it was harmful etc so I'm, I'm waiting for that in the meantime, it's just me trying to respect them and have them respect me and, and kind of put the beliefs aside and being willing to have open discussions and dialogues if they're willing. Um, I'm still learning where to push, where not to push. Yeah, it's, I lost friends. Um, luckily, my brother is my favorite person and I, we're, I, there are plenty of things we don't agree on or there, I don't know if there's plenty of things. There are things we don't necessarily agree on. Um, and yet I can't imagine anything about religion ever coming between us. Um, and so I'm very fortunate in that set, but I also lost friends. I, 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 
I wish you the best and, and hope that you get that uh, great experience of finding somebody else. I found other people in my family that were closeted atheists. Mm. Um, but you know, and it's not, I don't, you know, I don't get to out them or, and, and wouldn't, um, but trying to have those conversations, I mean, I, yes, I, I was, my folks thought I was working for the devil. My ex-wife th folks thought a grandmother thought I was the devil. Um, so, you know, we're competing there. It's, uh, I, I, I would have expected working for the devil to pay a little better, but, uh, sure. you know. where's all that fun sin? It seems yeah, like everything I, stayed the same. I, I'm waiting for all that George Soros money too, from, from switching from being a ditto head to a, a left wing nut job. Mm -hmm. Um, so th this is a, a kind of a strange question because I don't know that I have an answer. Can you think of what concept was most significant in the, in the conflict between what you used to believe and what you believe now? What concept was most important for you to get an understanding of to allow that change? Man, that is an excellent question. I've actually been meaning to kind of put together like a hierarchy of of, of deconversion issues in general and kind of see like what led me there the most, but yours is a little different. Yours is the, the hardest one to, to rationalize or like make a full 180 on, if I'm understanding you correctly. There's probably a few, but to give you an answer, I'll give you two. The morality thing is a big one. And I know that that's like the common like Christian quip of, well, see, you just, you know, you just don't understand God and, and you don't have a good enough understanding of the Bible and he's not evil. How could he do this? He's perfection. All of these things. I was so ingrained in that. And I had so many good arguments for that, that to finally come to the very, very, very obvious, you know, if this God were real, here is his character, which I know has been overdone and overplayed so much, but it's, it's simply the truth. That one was the starkest contrast for me. And then secondary under that would just be dealing with then like, who was Jesus? What is he really? What is the historicity here? What is worth believing about him? Uh, are his teachings actually still good? And there's, there's, there's value in this religion or it, did he actually double down and, and get, you know, worse with the additions of hell and things like this. And, and so, you know, it's funny cause it's all supposed to be one, but dealing with God's character and then Jesus's character were just two huge things to um to break down to to truly deconstruct if i yeah. answered your question i'm not sure if that's what you were leaning in you did and and this is one of the things that i think's been extra difficult for me um in in listing off all the things that i naively believed um i started working on a book uh much a long time ago and and the purpose of the book was i wanted before my parents even knew i wanted to get my thoughts down in a way that would explain to them why i no longer believed why they shouldn't look at this extremely negatively like they've lost a son or that the son is a devil i wanted to be able to write the sort of thing where anybody could grasp hey i don't have good reason to believe this and while that book, like every other book I've started, has, has yet to see the light of day, um, a shortened version of it happened because my mom wrote me a, an email one day um, that I, the title of the email was just from a mother's love, I believe. And she went through all the reasons she believed, all the things that she worried about, all of you know how good God was. There is a God. He's real. Your mother wouldn't lie to you. and uh, I've told the story before, but I wrote back a really long, detailed, rip it to shreds. Let me tell you everything that's logically fallacious in what you said. Let me tell you everything that's morally repugnant in everything that you said. Let me, I'm just boom, boom. I treated her like she was just any other caller to the show. And I clicked send without proofreading or anything. And I was like, I think I just killed my, my relationship with my mom. And what I got back was, was an email that basically said, you know, oh, you're just like me. I had all those same questions and Jesus oh. fixed it all. And on the day that she found out I was an atheist, um, she supposedly thanked God because she'd been asking God for years, what's wrong with my son? And that's the day that, that God answered her and told her what was wrong with her son. There's, there's a, 
a rationalization process where rather than dealing with the fact that we have two people, one of whom is convinced of something and one of whom is not, um, there's something wrong with this one. And of course, it's difficult for me to counter because when I look at it, there's something wrong with my mom. There is something fundamentally irrational and um, broken about how my mom assesses these claims. That doesn't mean that she's irrational in all things, although she may be on a great number of things. She may believe the earth's flat. She listens to some real bizarro YouTube channels. But on this, it is. And so now you're in this position where you have a, a proposition, some God exists, which may in fact, well, theism is generally unfalsifiable, but the God proposition that she and others are, are advocating for may or may not be unfalsifiable, but certainly they haven't been able to demonstrate it. And so you've got one group of people who are saying, hey, you haven't met your burden of proof, so I can't believe that. And the other, and the, they're just replying, uh, yes, we have, it's obvious, there's something wrong with you. I've spent two decades now engaging in live conversations with people on a front like that, and it, sometimes it goes really well. Let's be honest, a number of times frustration just gets the better of me, where I, you can lead someone up um, to, the, to the evidence you can lead someone to evidence, but you can't make them think, like leading a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Um, you're, you talked about doing this in a way where you're, you're mostly dealing with the people that you care about, the people around you, so that you're maintaining that relationship. Have you also had discussions with them where the goal was either to get them to truly understand what your position is, or even worse, the hope of accepting and agreeing with it, even though we, we know that's failed. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, right? I, I, you know, I have two kids so that it changes, uh, it changes things. Like the conversation with my mom, isn't just about like, how are we going to work? It's here's what you cannot tell my kids. It's here's the influence you cannot, uh, you cannot have here. Um, you know, I won't allow it. Here's the boundary. Let's talk about healthy boundaries. I'll hear from you on this. Uh, maybe there's some, light ground we can find for you to, you know, pray for them, but not in front of them, whatever, right? Like, uh, of course she can do whatever she wants in her private prayer time. Um, but those conversations are where it gets a little more real, where it's like, Hey, you know what, if you're telling me you think you have the right to tell my kids something, then answer it to me. Right. You know, if, if Paul says women can't preach, why are you a missions director? Why have you cherry picked your way around the Bible to get upset about gay marriage, but you have no problem standing up on Sunday and teaching men? Like, let's let's start getting into it and you know to a certain extent sometimes and and this is an example with her but i've i've had something like this where it's like if you're going to preach at me if, if you want me to consider your position like fine but let's have the respect that it, it can go two ways and it usually doesn't go very well after my part because if they wanted to deal with that they would have already dealt with it somewhere they knew somewhere they've heard for for most people that i've interacted with and you know, there's two parts of my deconversion to go back to your previous question. And it's, it's important here too. going from fundamentalism and waking up, you know, still believing in, in Yahweh and Jesus and salvation and heaven. That's so different than believing the earth is 6,000 years old. And that no, like I was a grown man that fully bought into the ark story for so long. It's so embarrassing to me. It's amazing what religion does to the brain. And that is where a lot of the logic and philosophy helped me deconvert down to a normal level of Christianity. And then it was some of the moral issues that pushed me over the edge. Um, but I've definitely tried to explain that to everyone in my circle. Like I, I like for you, even if we don't agree, even if you never want to have another conversation, if it offends you so much, I'd like for you to hear me out on, on my position, what led me here. And most people have been receptive to that, but there, you know, there's not much else to say after that, unless people want to debate. And I just haven't found that to be super beneficial inwardly. Uh, or in a personal relationship. Maybe that's why I made a channel to do it outwardly. But um, yep. yeah, some boundaries there. Well, we're queuing up some callers uh, and, and we've got at least uh, one theist. We'll get to callers very soon. So thanks everybody for, for tuning in. I've got some announcements to do, but I have one 
uh, last difficult question, or maybe difficult, maybe easy. Um, I don't know. So I went from being a full on Rush Limbaugh ditto head listening during my lunch break, um, right wing conservative fundamentalist Christian to being the exact op, the polar op. Like I'm, there are people who are probably farther left than I am, but there's no denying where I was once significantly right of center on a number of issues. I'm now significantly left of center. And that this was coupled with my transition from being a Bible believing Christian to being an atheist. And I have difficulty figuring out, no, not entirely. I, I have difficulty figuring out exactly which happened first or mm. whether they happened together because I was in the Navy and, um, during, I was in the Navy during Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and had to uh, be a part of the process that kicked some people out of the Navy for merely being gay. And in one of those instances, they had done nothing. And somebody else who, who knew they were gay um, intentionally outed them in order to get them kicked out of the Navy. And I'm like, this is somebody who, ha who was good and good for the Navy and had a career and was career-minded. How can this be uh, just? And, you know, it was still, I, I was, you know, personally opposed to homosexuality and gay marriage and, all, and everything else. So I know there were some things that I moved more left on before I moved away from religion. But there were other things that definitely happened after I stopped believing where I took an inventory. Well, if, if I don't believe, you know, in Jesus, then what's my justification for, for thinking murder is wrong? You know, what is my foundation for these things? Um, I don't, I'm not, not, we don't have to get into the political aspects. I don't know how far left you've gone, but I would imagine you're significantly left of where you once were on a number of issues. Do you think that happened before, during, or after the bulk of your falling away from religion? Yeah, I don't want to copy your answer, but it's similar, maybe just with different particular topics. Some of, you know, I mentioned like the last straw broke the camel's back was some of the morality stuff. And so I think it was where I was starting to like lean on some of these issues. Again, uh, sitting around the table with my mom, I have a very specific memory where she in, in the same breath was upset about a recent gay marriage law that was passed and a recent uh, law about praying in school that had been kind of smashed down. And so she's talking about both of those things in the same breath while she's prepping her, her Saturday night uh, missions talk. and. I realized that I was starting, and this was when I was still fully bought into Christianity. I didn't understand anymore why God would make people gay to have it be this mortal sin. I, I couldn't understand that. And I was even realizing that from a Christian perspective, I should want separation of church and state because if the Muslims are ever the majority, I'm not going to want my kids praying to Allah. And like yeah. I started to come to these more rational positions that then I had to say, well, God's not even that rational. So maybe there's an issue here. And then after the full deconversion and I'm taking that same inventory and I'm going through, what do I believe? Why do I believe it? What's the grounding? What's the basis for it? There are things that I've actually still hung on to. I might be more conservative than some people who have deconverted. Um, and I'm very liberal on other things. I, I have no idea how to even classify myself anymore. It's just yeah. kind of a topic by topic, issue by issue. Yeah. It's one of those questions that comes up and, you know, don't me wrong. Um, there are some absolutely awful hardcore atheists that have been atheists as long as I've been alive who have some of the most vile, anti-progressive, anti-humanist, um, right-wing type of ide ideology. Uh, and so I spend, I spend a good deal of my time arguing <laughs> with atheists, both on political front, but also, also I more than almost more than anything, Lions are probably at the top of the list, um, but bad arguments from atheists drive me nuts because they're wholly unnecessary, and yet these are the best-intentioned people who are fundamentally correct, but the human penchant for hyperbole takes over. And now, instead of saying, hey, I don't have good reason to believe in God, it's there are no God, gods are impossible. Hmm. And instead of, you, you, Christians can't even demonstrate that Jesus actually existed. It's Jesus is a fiction invented, you know, mythicist view, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I see this over and over again. 
And I understand why people might go, oh, well, you just replaced one religion with another, or you just replaced, you know, one ideology with another. And to some extent, that's true. But for the people, for what I'm actually trying to advocate for, of applying critical thinking and skepticism and evaluating questions to find out, do I have good reason to believe this? It's like, it's like some people have completely bought into the fallacy fallacy of if I can find a flaw in your argument, then clearly your conclusion is false rather than if I can find a flaw in your argument, then clearly I should not accept the conclusion. They, they confuse and conflate those two. Um, now that you're, by the way, there should be a link to the uh, Mindshift Skeptic channel below, but now that you're producing content on this um, and you're trying to provide a, a, a path to help people, on the, on the raw education front, what, what have you found most, uh, I guess, what are you happiest about achieving and interacting with on your channel? And what's been the most frustrating part of this over the last few months? Yeah. Wow. So much frustration. Um, you know, it's, it's unbelievable. You get to a point you, you remember that you used to believe these things, but you can't really believe that people still believe these things. And so when I get the, the just most obvious comment of, well, you just wanted to sin and, uh, and, oh, you hate God, you know, things that are, that are absolutely ridiculous positions to take, even if you're a Christian in how you view an atheist, I'm blown away. And I, I still just have the biggest urge to like, let's get into it then. Like, let's break every single thing down. And, and that's quite frustrating because you just can't and, and, and people just don't listen. Um, so I would say that some of the sheer just brute force, I'm going to keep pounding against this wall with the same one liners and quips that I've heard from my favorite apologist. And I'm not going to listen or care about what you have to say, then why are you here? Um, you know, I, I, even as a Christian, I really respected like real dialogue real arguments. I was wrong about mine, but I still would never have acted the way that people act online that I'm now very aware of. Um, what's I think working really well is I think people have seen from me, hopefully, and I know I've gotten comments of this, a, a genuine just care. I, I uh, you know, maybe I, I don't have to base it anything. I don't have to root it in an objective morality from God, but I do have empathy for human man. And I'm very aware of how trapped someone can be by religion. And I take great pleasure in being able to help people alleviate that. And going through the Bible objectively has been a big part of my channel. I have a secular Bible study series and I'm doing my best to, you know, I, I'll tell you the problematic passages and contradictions at the end. But for the first 40 minutes of this, I'm going to tell you what's actually happening in history that we can know if we can know anything. I'm going to tell you what's objective, uh, when they wrote this, how we know that, what the scholars say, and at least help you be able to think about it better, even if you do believe. And so that, I think, has been the most constructive and, and well-received part of the channel. Yeah, it's you mentioned something that, that I, I'm finding myself... Uh like having flashbacks of how sometimes it's, I still have my, I keep my hats around so I can, you know, put on my Christian hat or whatever else I need to put on. I have a very difficult time remembering exactly what I believed and worse. I have a more difficult time remembering exactly why, because while I was active in the church um, and, you know, the, interacting with a bunch of other people who believe is a piece of cake. And if you're one of the ones that knows slightly more than most of the other people there, because you, you spent more time studying it and you know, they, you get the cafeteria Christians that come in or the Sunday morning, you know, believers. And if I'm there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and doing Monday visitation and youth group, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, I'm part, I'm part of the youth leadership stuff and I'm, you know, uh, doing many sermons and all this, but I never in the entire time that I was active in the church. Now I was a believer for many years after, but during the time I was active in the church, I never once had any sort of debate or discussion that I, I recall with an atheist. I would witness to non-believers not realizing that I was potentially talking to an atheist. For some reason, non-believer and atheist had very different connotations then. Um, but there was no debating. There was no, there was nothing that ever remotely challenged or, or seriously challenged 
um, my view. And so when I look back, for me, it was when my views got challenged and I cared about the truth, if for no other reason than I was cocky that I'm right, I know I'm right, I know that I know that I know that I know that Jesus Christ is Lord. I know that my name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I know this, and I know that this is a sinful. I know all these things, but I didn't. I didn't know them. I was familiar with them. I knew them in the sense of familiarity, not in the sense of uh, sound epistemological conclusions. And the cockiness of knowing that I was right about Jesus made it i was more eager when my when my views were challenged to go prove those people wrong oh you you say there's no good reason to believe i started reading you know atheist stuff classical atheist stuff everything from you know Vol voltaire and hume and uh ingersoll and and all of this and i'm like this is gonna be easy i'm gonna be able to knock this out of the park and prove them all wrong and then I think one of the key things was I cared enough about the truth and I was honest enough that when I was clearly proven wrong, that I didn't have good reason, uh, belief wasn't a choice. It wasn't even an option. It was just like it, it vanished. Yeah. And I was left sitting there going, hang on, what just happened? And what are the consequences of this? And I don't, I really wish there was a way to, inst to instill this sort of soul searching for lack of a better word um into everybody else i don't think it's something that a lot of people spend time doing yeah it's and and it's frustrating i i've i've been thinking a lot lately it almost seems like there's personality types that are resistant i don't want to say like oh we care about truth and they don't but i, I have people in my life that they'll hear everything i i've said which would have bomb dropped me as a believer and yeah. they're like, well, you know, maybe, but when I pray, I feel this. And it's, it just, it doesn't matter. It's like the hierarchy goes feeling than truth. And for me, if the truth didn't matter, then, then something was going to be flawed with my feelings. And, to, and it's just, that's just not the case for everybody. And it's, it blows me away because it's such my personality that, and I, I'm not even saying it's worse or, or better, but I think there are just certain personality types that don't have the same care about truth. And I, I don't mean that to, to take them down because it's just what I've realized. And it's frustrating and it's sad because you do know that all those feelings could be better used and you do see the harm that's happening to them. And you do see what they're missing out on in this life because of that. And, uh, and so bumping truth up the hierarchy level is, you know, another huge goal of, of the channel for me. Well, I can sit here and, and have about, I don't know, 12 more hours of, of back and forth conversation on this, of comparing our, our, our stories out and our thoughts on this. But it's a call-in show, and welcome, everybody, to uh, the line. I've got a couple of announcements to remind everybody of, and then we will get right into calls. So if you, by the way, if you're a theist who's called in to joust with me in the past, um, and you don't necessarily like the way I do things, here's your opportunity to joust with somebody else who you may like better. So uh, we'll keep some lines open for the theist. But as a reminder, this is one of many shows here on the Line Network that's run by uh, Jimmy Snow. I can't fire him. I wouldn't fire him, but I can't fire him. But anyway, uh, in addition to my Wednesday night show here called The Hangup, which is often about politics, but it's sometimes about religion, and basically it's about whatever I'm hung up on at any given t time. Um, in addition to this program, tomorrow you can call in to the Transatlantic Call-In Show with the OGs, Arden and Katie are going to be on. If you want to know about trans rights, trans rights issues, if you want to get involved and find out uh, how transphobic you are or aren't, or what this news item means or what this uh, medical article means or why, uh, you know, there's atheist over here that's saying this and atheist over here that's saying that. All of those things are an option. 2 p.m. Central, uh, right here on the line, Transatlantic Call-In Show. Um, then on Fridays and Saturdays, uh, that's when we end up posting a lot of clips, but there's other new things that are going to be happening, including some debate-like uh, shows and debate-style shows with a slightly different format than you're used to seeing elsewhere. We'll have more announcement of that, including uh, in boss that is still in, in play. We have already a couple people lined up. We're just putting the final touches on stuff after Jimmy got sick and I got sick and there was lots of distractions. Plus I got lots and lots of snakes to sell. 
Um, and I'll miss a couple of a uh, couple weekend shows doing reptile conventions. But on Sunday, Jimmy and I will be here for at uh, 2 p.m. for the Sunday show. That's the primary call in and talk religion uh, with us. The probably I would say, mm, yeah, I'll say it. It's the best damn religious call in show um, you're going to find on Sundays. Except when I'm here, and then it's just terrible. Monday's a skeptic talk, and Shannon Q will be uh, will have guest Will McCaffrey uh, on this Monday, and that's I think also at six o'clock Central. And on Tuesday, I will be back a day early to do an episode of uh, Dying Out Loud with Dave Warnock, um, and I'll also be here probably next Wednesday to do an episode of the hangup. There is a, there is a non-zero chance that next Wednesday's episode will get preempted. Um, cause even I get tired of me despite what people think. And so I might do the hangup on Tuesday and then take a Wednesday off. We're not sure yet. We're still talking about it. Huge. Thank you to all of our moderators and to Phoebe who's call screen today. I got all these calls lined up. Here we go. We have Jack in Arizona who is a theist and wants to talk to us about the problem of evil. Welcome, Jack. You're on with Brandon and Matt. Hi, Matt. Hi, Brandon. How are you? Howdy. Doing all right. Doing yeah, all right. What do you got? I wanted to uh, hear your take on if you think the problem of evil is a compelling reason in and of itself to believe or disbelieve in a god or at least in a good god. Yeah, Matt, you tell me how much you want me to talk and how much you want to answer. Uh, you know, there is a, a famous YouTuber, uh, since I'm aspiring to be a YouTuber, Alex O'Connor, who prefers to call it the problem of suffering. And I think there's good reason for that. But to answer your question, I think that the problem of evil should be a consideration to not believe in a God if that God claims to not be evil, if that, cl if that God mm -hmm. claims to be all benevolent. So, I mean, that's the, the short answer. I think if you want to believe in an evil God, fine. Um, but if you have a holy book that is dedicated to professing that this God is anything but evil, even though at the same time it professes he's the creator of evil, I think we have an issue that needs to, to start being addressed. Uh, my question would be, what would the world have to look like in order for you to uh, maybe feel like it's possible that God could be good? Like what would have to change? Yeah, I uh, again, Matt, you're going to cut me off. Uh, no, you you'll have to cut me off. Okay. Um, I wouldn't be the kind of person that says there can't be any suffering. Fine. And and there's good philosophical arguing about uh, a certain amount of necessary suffering in a world that actually has free will. I have problems to think that God has given us free will, but if you, even if we want to play by the rules of the Bible and believe that we have free will, I think that we have a clear abundance of unnecessary, avoidable suffering that we do not need in a world that has to have it for free will to work out. I don't know if I'm making sense to you. And so if you want to, if you want to go further with that, let me know. Yeah. But so like, for example, um, what things do you think are incompatible? Like, for example, one thing that's often brought up, and I think it was Stephen Fry that mentioned this when he was asked, what he would say to God. I think he said something along the lines of, you know, what's the deal with cancer and children, right? And he went on and listed a number of things he felt were incompatible with a world that has a benevolent God. And I guess my follow-up question to that would be, like, how far do you have to go? Like, obviously, cancer and children is terrible, but we should also remove all disease, right? And then kids also die in car accidents, so we should probably get rid of cars and they die in house fires, so we should get rid of fires. Like, it seems like you could take that argument basically anywhere, and any existence of suffering whatsoever would appear to be proof that God is not good. I understand yeah. what you're saying. I'm going to jump in for a second here, because I'm somebody who doesn't tend to use the problem of evil uh, or the problem of suffering uh, as a primary argument against a God concept. I realize that it's it's incredibly powerful for a lot of people. Some people are are have given up religion entirely because of this. It's just the the um, the, the excessive suffering, the the senseless suffering in the world doesn't make sense to them. Uh, for me, saying hey, what would need to change about the world so that it wouldn't be a, a problematic God? If you have as a notion that we're all going to live, or that some portion of humanity is going to live forever in a heaven where there is no suffering. 
um, and that God already knows who's going to go there, then why not just make everybody who's going to be there there already and skip past all the rest of this? If God's the type that knows everything that's going to happen and has a plan, um, then he knows I'm going to spend eternity in hell or annihilated, and you know my mom's going to spend eternity in heaven. Why put any of us through any of that? Why not just create those individuals there? Um, it, to, to say that really it question. needs to, to say that it needs to happen means that God is at least deficient in in what he can do. But I don't I don't think that any atheist I've talked to is opposed to the notion of suffering. And I appreciate the fact that you're asking, like, where do you draw the line? Um, God could have created a world where human beings reproduce asexually. There are other creatures on the planet that reproduce asexually, and we could have been one of those species. And if that's the case, then you no longer have any rape, which means that you can't have sexual mm -hmm. assaults against kids. And that resolves a massive problem. It doesn't violate anybody's free will. People still have free will. It's just that this isn't a part of who we are. And that doesn't even fit into the category of normal, like excessive suffering that people like to go to. Because when you go to something like cancer, if Adam and Eve's sin uh, brought sin and death into the world, is that what brought cancer into? Is that part of it? And does it need to be cancer? And I, th I think one of my favorite examples um, from Sir David Attenborough is there's a worm that lays its eggs inside of you and the worm eats through your eyeball. At a minimum, that doesn't need to exist. That level of bizarre um, interaction between two species has nothing to do with free will, has nothing to do with our desires. It just, here's something that nature produced that is absolutely terrifying. Like, like if you don't shudder when you hear about a worm that is eating its way out through your eyeballs, and every, I don't know, like, that to me is the pinnacle of inhuman to not just absolutely shudder when that happens. Things like that. Oh, yeah, for sure. I think and there's a pretty metal. Yeah, and th th there's a, a huge list of them. And I think that the most reasonable explanation when you look at all this is that there's so much in nature that does not give a crap about us and that only makes sense in the light of an unguided process where it's survival. I, I hate survival of the fittest because that's not a really accurate description of evolution. But w where this sort of I'm going to live in order for me to live, something else has to die. That's that's everything. I don't care if you're vegan or not. In order for you to live, something has to die. And there's a lot of it that seems to be in order for me to live, something else has to die in a very particular cruel way. I think that's my kind of take on problem of evil. Well, it's interesting you mentioned like a parasitic worm. Uh, I think the scariest form of evil comes from humans. And I think the idea that God could take away evil without taking away human free will, I, it just doesn't make sense to me because obviously I'd like to live in a world without genocide and war and torture and murder and abuse of every kind. But it seems like if we were to do that, we would have to also take away the capability to choose. And I think like any story, whether you're talking about a human story or say the art that we create that mimics life seems like the vast majority of suffering comes from human choice i uh is there free will i'd like to say is there free will in heaven i actually don't believe in i'm not a christian i the sure. reason why i'm no longer a christian is because of your show um i say the closest thing that i ascribe to i'm not sure if you're familiar with alan watts yeah i find him really compelling i think he makes a very good argument a lot of atheists joke that um god is the hide and seek champion and honestly i don't think it's that far off uh i think this also kind of alludes a little bit to and i don't want to get off topic because you were making some good points but 
I think this alludes a little bit to the problem of divine hiddenness. I think if God was plainly visible all the time, I think it would spoil a lot of the mystery. Like a lot of movies, when I go in, I don't want to know the ending. Like if I walked into the movie The Sixth Sense and someone spoiled the ending that Bruce Willis was dead the whole time, I'd be Careful. pissed off. So. Oh, man, why'd you do that? Shit, sorry. I didn't mean to do that to anyone who hasn't seen that movie. But I think the reality is the ma- part of the amazing aspect of life is that you get to discover, you know, the purpose for yourself. And I feel like if God showed up when we were six or seven and said, hey, I'm God, here's the purpose of life, you know, here's all the mysteries of the universe, I feel like that would take away most of the fun, don't you? I mean, like... Jack, first of all, you're talking about my three favorite things. And so I'm, I'm racing them thousand miles a minute here free will divine hiddenness and the problem of suffering or evil but you keep doing the same thing that i'd like to maybe point out which is this little black or white fallacy of if they're you know going back to the first part hey okay where's the line you know some kids are still going to die in car accidents so therefore there shouldn't be Mm -hmm. a line at all or the line shouldn't be back here like the fact is there is a line and you can have less divine hiddenness without god sitting on your shoulders 24 7 ruining the mystery right there's there's this whole gray area in between that even getting back to the free will thing god created the initial framework right he Mm -hmm. you know to to matt's point about hey he could have made us asexual he made us people that were capable of genocide of of forming large groups like this like he set these boundaries in place and then supposedly let free will just take off but it's so much had to be chosen from a all-powerful all-knowledgeable foreknowledge being that doesn't make sense even with free yeah. will you know what i mean i think it's it's impossible for me to be able and i think you're completely right i'm probably committing 15 fallacies because i'm not the i'm not best trying to call you out on a specific fallacy i'm just saying like there's a there's a real obvious lacking of like could there have been something less could god still i think a there could have certainly been something less suffering or less painful um but i think in order for human beings to be able to consciously choose good i feel like the option for evil has to be there if even like, let's say even for if example we agreed on that though think about it think about what you just said it could be less painful it could be less suffering then that's yeah. the whole that's you wrapped up the entire problem of suffering it's not that suffering shouldn't exist it's that there's an unnecessary amount and the soon as soon as you can say there could be less god could have made our pain receptors dial those receptors down 50 percent, mm-hmm. right like and we'd still have all the same appreciation we'd still love the sunshiny sure. day from the cold day but we wouldn't have to freeze to death at x temperature it could go way lower a point that the earth can never get to like there's uh billion trillion possibilities that god could have done things different to achieve less suffering less pain and that's not what we have i think you're it's completely cool. right he could have dialed back the pain sensors 50 percent, but i think that would have also dialed back our capacity to appreciate like i think a lot of our capacity to uh grow and develop as human beings comes from our own suffering like i know in my personal life in the life of a lot of people i know like when i got cancer and overcame that, that really made me value life a lot more. And it made me appreciate the good parts of life so much more. I mean, God could have not, and I'm not saying God gave me cancer, but more than anything, it's just the society we live in and all the pollution and, you know, bad foods we eat. I think the vast majority of cancer is probably human created, but in any Would case, you wish I think on the your- re- can I ask you this for, and I'm, I'm being sincere, this isn't a gotcha question. Knowing that you had cancer and you've been able to appreciate something in life better because of the trial you went through, which I applaud you, you made lemonade out of lemons and that's wonderful. Sure. But would you wish for your kids then to also have cancer so they could come to the same realization? Or would you hope that there are other lesser things in life that can still challenge them that would allow them to still reach your uh, appreciation? That's a great question. And honestly, I wouldn't wish cancer on anyone, not even a worst enemy. I mean, it's terrible. I well, if God loves us and we're his children, years. why would he wish it on us? And by allowing for its very existence, like I understand you're using a personal example, but I think it's just that clear. Yeah. Like you're saying, 
hey, I wouldn't wish this on anyone. And you're not an all benevolent being. You probably even have enemies and people you don't like, and you still wouldn't wish it on them because you know that no matter yeah. how much pleasure you've received from beating it and being appreciative of life, it didn't compensate you fully. See, this is the whole problem that I think we have in general is that there's this compensation that we'll get from the pain, from the suffering, even if the fi I final think... compensation is heaven. I don't think it, you can ever say that, it, that it's enough because it's, it's unnecessary. I think a question I would ask to you is like, are you okay with, I, are you okay with your kids say, Let's say I don't know if you have kids or not, but you know, let's say you have kids have and two beautiful they're young in a kids, relationship. So the with that, so let's say yeah, your kids grow up and they're in a relationship and they get broken up with and they have heartbreak. I mean, should we wish that they never go through that, or does that grow them as a person? I mean, I think there's a lot of things in life that if we never faced any challenges, let's say we lived a life where everything was handed to us. Why? You never face any disease. Hang on, Jack. Why do you keep going back yeah. to this straw man? Neither myself, nor Brandon, nor Alex, nor any of the other people who are talking about a, 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 the problem of excessive suffering is suggesting that anyone could or should go through life without anything remotely negative happening to them. And yet, every time we turn it, well, not every time, but when we, when we turn it back over to you to talk, you keep mm -hmm. going to this Oh, this could build people's character and everything else. Yes, I agree. And you know what else? If I put my hand on a hot stove, it burns me and it teaches me what not to do. And there's a lesson to be learned and I can learn something good out of it. But could I have learned that lesson another way? And could it have been the case that instead of ever having the opportunity to burn myself and feel pain, I would burn myself and get damaged without the pain. Um, and that would be enough to potentially learn the lesson. This is a good chunk of this is a failed imagination on the part of human beings of what a God could do. And what you're actually kind of loosely arguing for is that it would be a reasonable response to the problem of evil or problem of suffering to say that God has created the best of all possible worlds for the goal that he has that, and you know, the, there's some goal to life that God has, and this is the best that it could be. And that's fine, but this is now part of why I'm not a fan of arguing about the problem of evil, because I don't think it strongly disproves any God. And I think that it's trivially easy for a God believer to say, oh, yeah, you know, you need some problems here so that you grow and learn. And, um, you know, there's free will and people interact. And so this is just the best that God could do for now, um, which doesn't get to why we, you know, couldn't all be, or who, he couldn't make whoever he wanted in heaven to begin with. But let's stop going to the, the hyperbole of suggesting that either of us are suggesting that we should live a life without suffering. We didn't do that. We wouldn't do mm -hmm. that. I don't want to make you think that because I think that would be dishonest for me to say. And I apologize if I at any point made you think that I, I believe that about you guys. I, I think that... Honestly, like in my view of it, I think that there's absolutely things that are unnecessary that don't help us grow as individuals. But I mean, you're right. There's things like there's types of suffering that I would love to see not exist. But as someone who has a very limited perspective, I think it's impossible for me to be able to see it from the bigger picture, you know, to not view it from my own lens. I mean, all I could do is contribute my own perspective. Yeah, I understand. I just think it's important to to zoom out on that perspective, right? You know, the the your the whole of the argument in general comes back to some kind of compensation, whether it is heaven or something we learn and glean in this life now. You know, the why not heaven now issue that Matt raised is uh, is the answer for the the four year old who's born in a third world country in a third world country and has a miserable life for four years until they starve to death. They never hear about God. Mm -hmm. And yeah, let's assume general revelation. So they somehow get to go to heaven, even though it's not what the Bible says. That's the compensation. I made you to torture you, to have you die without knowing me. And by my grace, you're still here in heaven now. Is this compensated? I, I th and many Christians believe that. Yes, that child is compensated. He was born of a fallen world with free will and God is making it right. I disagree. And, and there's a thousand thought experiment analogies that I won't 
bring up now, but I'd encourage you to maybe look some up on the issue of why not heaven now apologetics, because I think it's a very hard thing to really argue that the immense human and suffering where we don't even get yeah. a benefit in this world is compensated in the next life. And that's why I don't agree in Christianity with Christianity. Sure. I'm um, sorry. You did say you're a theist. Yeah, I'm, I'm a theist, but I would say, especially like I, I actually um, started watching Atheist Experience back in like 2000, I want to say seven or eight after I left a really fundamentalist church. And it helped me a lot. So, I mean, I do appreciate being able to deconvert that way, I think. But a big part, and I'm, I'll acknowledge a big part of the reason why I still believe is I, I can't get past the fact that um, there's absolutely an element of wishfulness or a, a desire for there to be a bigger purpose. So I can absolutely acknowledge that I'm biased in that way. But yeah. when I get down to trying to objectively line up the evidence, you know, the, the arguments from atheists against the argument or, or against the existence of a good God or of a God in general, um, I don't necessarily find them convincing. And I guess on some level, just the vast complexity of the universe, and I know complexity isn't proof of God, but just for me, it just, it strikes me as weird that we're this, amalgamation of atoms that are communicating through this device that would be magic 100, 200 years ago. And I don't necessarily attribute that to God, but I think it's fascinating that there's so many things we don't understand. And I guess I would be really disappointed if I learned that it's just oblivion and there's no inherent meaning to life. I would like to believe that, but I acknowledge that I'm biased. I think I'd be more disappointed to find out that there was some afterlife that we had no good reason to think existed or to be able to verify or to be able to understand the, the criteria or the soteriology that might potentially lead to that. It's like, yeah, when people look at, I, I had a, I had a cousin that, um, lived for a few years, but never really left a bassinet. Um, and you take that child and the one that Brandon was talking about earlier that lives for four years and absolutely suffers in, in poverty and misery and malnutrition, mm -hmm. um, and some other, take a baby that survives three seconds after delivery before stroking out in a, in a grand suffering fashion and just dies immediately what i hear from some believers who are trying to make sense of those three scenarios is mm -hmm. something that i know provides comfort for them because it used to provide comfort for me and now it absolutely fucking pisses me off because what they'll say is ah god afflicted that person for our benefit. There was some lesson that we needed to learn and we needed to learn it so bad that God allowed this absolute waste of a life of someone who never, you know, never really felt joy. You talk about a kid getting heartbroken after their first love. Um, yeah, that's bad, but there was joy before that. And, the no, there are all these people who say, oh, the life is so hard. The antinatalists who are like, oh, you brought a child into the world without their consent when life is just way more miserable than it is pleasurable. Well, I don't find life more miserable than pleasurable, despite having quite a lot of miserable things about it. But what I find most frustrating isn't that there's misery or pain or suffering, but when it's completely uncoupled from joy. And I, my life's had a, mountains of joy at different times. I, I, I was joyous multiple times today um, while having a toothache and a stomachache. It, the, the notion that God needs to inflict and, and make a child suffer so that somebody else can come to some realization is barbaric and, and wholly unimaginative. What kind of God can't teach a, a, a properly functioning human mind, a valuable lesson without torturing another one. What kind of God make on a bet 
allows the torment of Job. What was the purpose of that? I always actually found that story to be really weird, actually. I agree. That was one of the more bizarre stories. And, and that was yeah. uh, something I, I like to uh, really, I asked a ton of questions. And actually, the church I went to, I didn't realize it until later, but they did a sermon where they said, if you don't agree with your church, just leave. And he started talking about a guy. He referenced a conversation he had. I didn't realize and put the pieces together. Oh, wait a second. He's talking about me. Because I was questioning the genocide account and all yeah. the things you're saying are things that I question myself. Like my grandparents died of cancer and they went through a lot of misery. And many times in my life and my parents' life, they questioned, well, why does this even exist? And I agree. I wish I had the answer to that, but I'm just a human. And I don't necessarily agree with the perspective that it's something that like God gleefully you know, does to humans just to kind of like prove his point or I don't necessarily, I think to me, I would like to live in a world without child death and suffering, but what would that look like? I don't really know how to compare the way the world is now to like the way the ideal world should look like. Like yeah, I, I think that's how human beings could. That's how you started the conversation. And I, and I think it's totally fair to have a failure of imagination on what a supreme being could or would do. But if we can very quickly imagine a world even slightly better, then it stands to reason that there is a world that could be slightly better or much better once given a divine mind and a supreme all powerfulness. Right. And so I understand and appreciate that you left Christianity because of the issues and you're just at theism in general and you like the idea of a god you like the idea of mystery and there's so much beauty and awe about the world and i can appreciate that there very well might be a creator i am totally agnostic to this concept i think that the yahweh character mm -hmm. is falsifiable um and i even think yeah. i would go as far as to say the problem of evil according to the the decrees that god makes about himself falsifies god at least his character or his ability to be true but when it comes to just wanting a god in general what i encourage you because i don't know how much more time we'll get with you is Man, it's once you have that God proposition, it's hard to let it go. I, I get that. And they're like, okay, yeah. the one I thought it was, it's not that one anymore, but surely there's a God. Then it's on him or it or her or whatever, right? Like back to divine hiddenness. You know, if we have a God that did create this world, this was the best he could do. Maybe he's not all powerful and maybe he moved on and he's out somewhere else creating another world. Why, why give him any more mind until he shows up and gives us reason to? You know, Matt talks all the time about the unreasonableness of believing in, in a God in general. And I, I think that take it a step further, not only is it unreasonable, but there, what, what can we do with it if we can't get any details? So if you don't believe in one of these man-made gods, you just believe in a creator, great. But then like move on from the rest of the issues that are associated with man-made gods. I think Alan yeah. Watts made a good point. I think I could end it on this. I would love to hear your perspective on this, but and I'm going to butcher this because he, he speaks very eloquently and I don't, but he basically said something along the lines of, you know, we look at the human immune system and we see all this chaos and destruction and this cell eating that cell and all of this madness. And then we zoom out and that's part of a healthy functioning immune system. And something that, and he doesn't say this, but I noticed it's like something we know is good, like a vaccine, the immune system to the immune system, a vaccine seems like a terrible thing because it's introducing a foreign pathogen and it seems like it's introducing an invader. So from the perspective of the immune system, it doesn't have the whole picture. It might think, oh, this needle coming into my arm, that's a terrible thing. But a vaccine is actually one of the best health advancements in human history. So I think it's easy for us as human beings with very limited perspective to say, the world as it stands now is not the best possible world, or this could be better, or that could be better. And I agree, you know, children starving and, and genocide, war, all these things are awful. But for us to be able to say, well, God could have done this and God could have done that, I mean, we could make that argument endlessly. I don't know the full purpose of suffering, and I don't pretend to, but I know personally in my own life suffering and the lives of the people around me, as a human, you could choose to turn that suffering into something meaningful and as a source of empathy and compassion for your fellow human and as a way to kind of bring together people. Or you could 
use it as a source of hate and division. It's up to you. That's really how I, I look at it. One thing, one thing, Matt, and then yeah. I'll, I'll shut up and I'll leave it to you. You went all the way back, man. You went all the way in a circle and you went back to that there's this all or nothing approach to it. Where, right now, there's a little girl that just got trafficked and she's being raped for the first time. And there's she's not some cell that's part of a great organism that's going to compensate for some vaccine, some good to get some better. There's nothing better coming for her. There's nothing better for me. There's nothing better for the human race for the fact that she was raped other than some man's sick pleasure. That's it. That's the only benefit. Like, I understand you want to say, like, zoom out and there's this organism, but we're people. And but we're is that conscious. on God or on the man who did that? I feel like that's a human problem, It would be on the person problem, who created the world problem. where this is a concept that can happen, who could have done better. And that's what we're arguing, that it, it doesn't really have to not exist at all, but there, it could be better. It's, so, really, it's really that simple, I think. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end this call mostly because we've got other people to get on to. And the other reason is, like I said at the beginning of this call, I genuinely don't give a shit about the problem of suffering. I don't find it. I find the conversations go like this all the time. And you mentioned, Jack, that we okay. have this limited human perspective, but I have no other perspective to use. Uh, limited human perspective is still the best perspective that we have, and it's the one that we're constantly trying to improve. So if the case is this is the best world that a god could come up with and still allow something like our will, free or otherwise, um, to bear out. Okay, cool. You've now explained away an apparent contradiction or apparent incompatibility between the way the world is and the way some version of some God might potentially want it to be. And yet, explaining the way con that contradiction, you still have all of the work in front of you, not you necessarily, but all the work in front of you to prove that there's any God at all let alone the one we just rationalized a compatibility with. And that's why I don't find this that great. It, it's, it's a, the problem of evil, the problem of suffering, needs someone who's advocating for a specific God that is fundamentally incompatible with something we observe. In that way, it gets, it gets put in a reductio ad absurdum to say that there may be some God, but the one you're advocating for is incompatible with a fact of reality. And that's its only usefulness. Um, on, on that mm -hmm. note, call us back another time, Jack. I got I got other calls I got to yeah, get to today, sure. but thank thanks for the time. Thanks, Jack. Take care. It is uh, it is a wild uh, dance that you can do. I, I really wish that maybe maybe one of these days we can get. Um, well, who knows? Maybe one of the callers today will have a different take on on God and and the problem of suffering. Um, but, all right, moving on. Boop, boop, boop. Here we go. Benedict, a caller from England, pronouncer he, him, an agnostic who has a question about a friend with magical thinking. So, Benedict, welcome. Thanks for waiting. You're on with Brandon and Matt. Oh, hi, Brandon. Hi, Matt. My first hi. time. Cheers. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm a little bit nervous. Um, and if you don't mind, I'm, I'm going to read what I've got here because it's going to be a lot quicker than me rambling on and not making much sense. So. If you indulge as me, long as it's not freaking war and peace or uh, something, go for it. Benedict, no, before no, no. you before you get going, hi, yeah. hi, producer here. Could you hi. move the mic just like slightly away from your face because we're peaking our levels a little bit? And uh, it would how be about that? Is that is that okay? Oh, a little still, more. A little more. Is that okay? Uh, not really, but just go for it. It's fine. We'll figure it out later. I'm really, I'm really sorry. I think it's probably my phone. Is it, is it so bad? Do you want to drop the call if it's that bad? No, it, it's all right. Just go for it. No, let's at least get the, the okay. question. If it's too bad, we can address it after you've hung up. But at a minimum, let's get your question. And you wait an, an hour and 40 minutes to ask it. This is true. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm seeking advice on how to deal with an old friend of mine, David, who I've known for over 30 years. We've had a bit of a falling out. Um, and I say we, uh, I mean, there's five of us in our little group. Uh, who live in a village. Uh, we all meet up uh, after work every Friday. And in between times, we all share lavish banter on our WhatsApp group. Um, now, I'll give you some context and background first. David and I used to share and, and have overlapping interests, such as the occult, uh, mainstream conspiracy theories, and some new age philosophies. But David was into it way deeper than me. Uh, what helped 
just what held me back, I guess, was a, an indelible sceptical and scientific streak, but I respected David's beliefs at that time. Anyways, since that time, I have moved on uh, from that worldview, and I'm now more invested in sceptical thought. And probably about 20 years ago, I identified as an agnostic atheist. Plus, I take a keen interest in debunking pseudoscience and magical thinking, quackery and the paranormal, etc. Anyway, meanwhile, my friend has been going ever deeper down the rabbit hole, especially since COVID. I have been challenging him uh, as often as I'm able to, but my respect for his beliefs and David Hayden himself has been eroded recently. And my tolerance of bullshit is uh, it's now very low. Um, anyway, uh, now we fell out and... Well, this happened when I shared a, um, a video, a YouTube video of someone debunking uh, some total crank who thinks his local council are installing energy weapons in street lamps. Now, I thought it'd be a laugh for us in the group, um, and I honestly and naively thought that David would also find this amusing. Uh, but after a heated exchange, David went off on a massive huff and um, he's reacted very badly and upset and has since uh, declared that he would rather spend uh, his time pursuing his campaigns, in inverted commas, uh, than enjoying the company of a tight group of his supportive friends who love him a lot. We've decided to let him go off for a little while to figure out his priorities. Hopefully he'll, he'll come back, which might be awkward, but hey. Uh, but there's a risk that he won't, that he'll just you know, appreciate that he doesn't need us, which we don't want. Now, I admit in retrospect that I could have dealt with this with less confrontation and making him look unhinged in front of his contemporaries, but, and this is also, again, more likely to drive him further down the rabbit hole. Uh, it, it, it's like maybe losing a family member to a cult, I guess. Um, and I'd like to know from your experience what's the best way forward? Hmm. I'm going to punt. Brandon, have you got thoughts on uh, how to deal with somebody who's situation. fallen down the conspiracy hole? Yeah, I mean, all I can do is sympathize with you. I have a, my, some of my closest friends are very conspiratorially minded. And, you know, it happens in their echo chambers and then, then you get stuck and then you believe everyone's trying to get against you. And so, I mean, my advice would just to be less confrontational. If you really care about them, you really want them in your friend group, make space for them. If you don't want that around yourself, maybe examine your own boundaries. I'm not one to give advice. I still have people yeah. in my life that disagree with me entirely and that I have no respect for their beliefs, religious or otherwise. And, uh, but it's because I love them and I'm, I'm willing to put up with that. So I would say let love conquer and don't care about what's in the streetlights. But that's, <laughs> you know, it's a little bit of a cop out because you can't control other people. So acceptance is all I've got for you, man. I, I, I accept that I've now, after what's happened, considering how, how extreme this, this thing that I shared with us was, that I thought there was absolutely no way in how they'd go for it because it was just so outlandish. And my, my plan has been for the past few years is to, is to catch him out effectively. Uh, I'm sorry, this is probably me being a bit bullish on this, but... I'm very passionate about this, as you can probably imagine. But if I could find something that he'll go, hey, that's ridiculous, I'd be able to say, ah, now then, why did you find that ridiculous? What's, you know, what was your critical framework? Where, where's the logic? Where, can I just find out where your dividing line is? And then possibly use that against him and say, well, let's look at all these other crazy beliefs. That's oh, it's probably a great a plan. It's think, a great plan, except I think yeah, he ran the whole rabbit hole with him and, and he believed in every last one of them. You never got that critical thinking. Yeah. Might just not be someone nope. that exhibits it. No. But this is all very much part of his, his mental health. Um, I mean, he lives, he, he has, we know he lives with trauma, um, childhood trauma. And I've come across, well, I've, pretty much all the people I've come across who've, who've, who are like David. Um, uh, have suffered in some way and, and live with your difficulties, um, emotional difficulties, usually from, from childhood. Um, so I'm not going to change that. Um, and, uh, you know, I appreciate that. It's a tough gig for him. But it's the, the, these people, they, I don't know. It's, it's, he, he's, I don't know what to do, though, because you know, a lot of it really grinds my gears um, because of you know, my outlook. So I guess I'm just going to have to let go of that. 
Is he religious, or is he just kind of in two yes, spirits? Yes, yes, no, it's more, it's more sort of new age, but it's a mixture of stuff. He was, you know, it's brought up with, you know, fairly sort of churchy, I guess. Um, quite yeah. sort of parochial upbringing. Um, and, but there was, the, he has a lot of issues with authority and um, um, authority figures, and, and he was kind of, he's very anti-establishment now because of his experiences there. But he, you know, he, he does have a lot of, I mean, all sorts of beliefs, you know, um, a lot of new age, but it's just, you, you know, anything that's some bizarre, he's, he's into it, you know, unquestionably, if it's, if it's strange, you could tell him something completely fictional. You could tell him something made up. I could, if I had the wherewithal and the imagination and the, and I don't have that kind of mind, but if I was cruel enough, I could make something up and prank him with it and go, well, ha ha. But I can't, I just can't bring myself to do that. Because he would, he would, he would believe it. Hook, line, and sinker. That's that's where he's at. But he seems to function. He has a job and he has a partner, and um, you know he has some friends around him. But it, um, we're all you know, beginning to despair. You know, kind of dig. I I don't want to be a dick, yeah. uh, but on occasion, no, I, I I will probably have to be. It's not your job to fix everybody in the world. And if somebody doesn't want to have a conversation, does it, somebody doesn't want to accept reason, somebody doesn't want to, to uh, have a different perspective, it's going to suck. Every single one of us has some friend or family member that is bought into Fox News nonsense or some bullshit somewhere, possibly flat earth, everything else. Um, sure. The, you, you just got to you do your best. You, you'd be open to having conversations. Um, I have no problem. I think, I think ridiculous ideas are by definition deserving of ridicule, but people aren't necessarily deserving of ridicule. So step one that would be to, to make sure that if I'm ridiculing something, I'm ridiculing the ideas and not the individual. And after that, it's not my problem. If I have a friend who's so upset yeah. And I find it ridiculous that he's advocating for a flat earth or, you know, uh -huh. conspiracy X, Y, Z. Uh, that's too bad. He has a right. They have a right to believe as their conscience dictates. And I have a right to say that it's absolute bullshit and that they're being a ridiculous buffoon uh, or that their beliefs are so far beyond the pale that I just can't even believe we're having. I, I can't believe I wake up every day in a world where most people still believe in a God, let alone the world where some people are starting to believe that the earth is flat or something similar. It's just one of those yeah. things you're just going to have to. Uh, yeah. Well, there's two things I'm learning from this, this uh, exchange between us is that I need to separate ridiculing the ideas from ridiculing the person. Cause I think he, so, okay, obviously he's taken this personally and it's undermined him. That's one thing. And the other thing is is to check my um, my tactics, my approach to him, and my motivations. Um, that I'm 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 not going. I don't think I'm going about it particularly the right way. I, I'm sure of that. And you know, I'm having to suck it up, as it were, and <laughs> appreciate that you know my way isn't always the best way. And that you can't change the world. All people, you, even the, those loved ones around you. So, well, there yeah. you go, man. If you love him, buy him a beer. Tell him you don't yeah. want to talk about his beliefs anymore, and you won't criticize him. And uh, watch watch the game together. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very much appreciated. That's, that's what I wanted to hear. Really, I, I was just sort of felt really alone in this because, um, yeah, I just don't know anyone else to talk about this because it's it's, it's very personal, and um, there's not many people going through <laughs> going through, yeah, where they don't want to lose a friend. Uh, in, in such specific circumstances, so um, I, I don't want to lose a friend either. But I've lost plenty of them, and over a lot of different stuff. So you know, if it's that big of a deal, um, I get along with my parents now because we've agreed to not Good, talk right? about the things that we that we uh, yeah. disagree on. Um, sure. And that's, I mean, it's one of the things where if you if you're in a relationship with somebody, friends, partners, parents, whatever. And the relationship is more valuable to you than being right or them not being wrong from your perspective, then you may just uh -huh. have to say, you know what, I'm never going to talk to about to you about this subject. Uh, 
beyond a surface level. Let's talk about the weather or whatever sports ball team we like or whatever TV show we're both obsessed with and try to keep the, the relationship at that level. But that is, I yeah. apologize, Benedict, but that's about the best I got. That, that's fine for me. And I really appreciate your time. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll let you go and you've got many more calls to deal with. And I, I, it's fanta- fantastic. I love your work. Both of you. Great. Stuff. Thanks so much. Cheers. Thanks very much. All right. I got two more calls that I want to get to before we start taking super chats. And by the way, we're not going to, we're not going to run late tonight. We're not going to be here till nine 30. We're not going to be here till nine. Um, uh, not only because uh, Brandon's got a slightly different schedule than I do, but I'm eager to be working more on Brandon's schedule because as much as I love spending all, all of my Wednesday here with everybody and you, you guys are my, my awesome weekly therapy. Uh, I got a handful of things to do. So we got, two callers that have been waiting for a very long time. One's an agnostic and one's a polytheist. And I think I want to end with the polytheist. So we're going to start with John, an agnostic from Oklahoma, pronouns are he, him, um, having a struggle of belief due to a near-death experience. So uh, I'm glad that your, de- that your death experience was only near and not actual. John, how can we help? Yeah, thank you. Hello, gentlemen. Um, always uh, interesting. <clears throat> Matt, it's nice to have Brandon on for the first time. Um, yeah. uh, this is new for me, a call-in. I've only been watching you for, I just caught on to your stuff within the last few months, sorry to say. Um, I'm going to go as quick as I can with the background to help put things in perspective real quick. Um, I'm having, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving one paradigm of coming out of the cult mentality of <clears throat> Scientology with the man who had left, who was high up and decided to do his own branch, if you will. And my mother got me into that when I was 12 and um, basically ended up being his servant for 40 years of my life. Um, I'm almost 60. I spent, you know, the majority of my, from 12 years on, uh, in that belief structure but was also it was modified from scientology in many ways but it is a belief structure it is a fallacy and there are so many interesting similarities as in in how that system is structured and works uh that i also found in christianity when i was younger so i was a baptist here in oklahoma my father was you know my whole family is a conservative Baptist Christian. Um, My father beat me over the head with the Bible to uh, make me a good kid, if you will. So I had that experience of Christianity till about the age of eight. Uh, It was brutal. It was rough. And so I was evil if this, or he would just, you know, always trying to make me a perfect child, behave perfectly, uh, because otherwise, He would look bad in his family's eyes and in God's eyes and whatever. That was a pretty terrible time. Anyway, um, mother left, middle of the night, took us kids. She pulled a 180, got involved with a hippie, free love, marijuana. He was a drug dealer. I'm eight. Um, an entire paradigm shift there. We're seeing Hare Krishnas, gurus, um, every other alternate type of spirituality her quest was like that and eventually ended up um hooking up with this guy who again had this offshoot of scientology that he was doing his intention was to create um human computers quote unquote and i'm a little lost people i'm a little lost john yeah yeah i I, i'm sorry as much I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sorry. trying to, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be, hang on. Uh, I'm not trying to be, you know, disinterested in this, but we can't do life stories here. I apologize. I wish I had, I wish I had, I was talking about actually Bible and things I've learned. And I apologize to do that. It's the first time. No, it's, it's fine. It's uh, fine. Here, I just, here, first of all, I, I'd all, first talk- of all, hang on, hang on. First of all, I always like to recommend recovering from religion, and there are people there that are more than happy to talk. Um, I really need 
if you're struggling with something from a near death experience, I definitely don't need to hear stuff that happened ages ago. What is it that you're struggling with now? Because Brandon and I may have good advice. We may not. Right. Um, I was trying to set that up because coming from such an intense paradigm, matter of fact, two of them, what happened is I had an NDE uh, near death experience. I wasn't gone for very long, but long enough that, yeah, at that moment of, um, of go to the light, this light is communicating with me. Um, and, you know, the, the nearest, closest understanding I would have of what that was would have been called God, right? And so I find myself now back in uh, to this uh, situation of, well, this is a different experience. This is just my mind. Is this meaning, oh, I'm being called back to this thing? I'm in that middle ground of, of not knowing. You know, I can't agree with the Bible wholly and wholeheartedly, and I can't agree with how I've been treated based on that. Um, what would you do if you had a near-death experience that spoke to you in a particular way but didn't say, you know, I am your God, Jesus is real, but seemed to connect you with everything and everyone so first of all so first of all if i had a near-death experience this is something that i've already studied um yeah and what we know is that a brain that is dying and potentially starved of oxygen there's no reason to think it's yeah. more reliable than a properly functioning brain secondly Absolutely. you have no idea hey just stop talking so i can do it Secondly, you have no idea what actually happened during that time because when we lose consciousness, when our brain is dying and we are resuscitated, the first thing that seems probable is that your brain tries to figure out what happened in the time that it lost. And so it's entirely probable that your brain just made up a story. Now, if in fact there was some God that gave you an experience, then it would be rational for that God to also communicate with you directly after that experience. If the experience is good evidence for a God and what a God wants from you, then you are now in a place where it is epistemologically fine for that God to also communicate with you directly. And when that doesn't mm -hmm. happen, that near-death experience is proof that that God isn't interacting with you now, almost certainly wasn't interacting with you then. And as long as there's no good reason to think, because if God has a message for you, he can give it to you. He doesn't need to give you a near-death experience to do so. He can communicate with you directly now. And if God has a message for you and he talks to you a little bit in a vague way in a near-death experience, why wouldn't he clarify it afterwards? The most probable explanation is that your brain was dying, and when you recovered, it made shit up. And even if that's not the correct answer, there is no reason to believe some other answer until you have new information. So what I would do if I had an experience like that, I wanted, I desperately, when I went and had triple bypass heart surgery, you have no idea mm. how much I wanted to have a near-death. Can you imagine what fucking stories <laughs> I could tell if I had anything at all like a near-death experience? Nothing. Nothing <laughs> at all. So I didn't have it. Wow. Uh, so clearly God didn't have a message for me. But if I had had it, I know enough about the research that's been done on it and about sound epistemology to realize that no vague, fuzzy, near-death experience is ever sufficient to believe that there was a God or that the experience actually happened. Mm -hmm. I would just double down, man. So I'll, I'll keep it super quick because, you know, Matt covered the neuroscience of it and there's a ton of research. I've been looking at it as well because it's one of the most, uh, it's, it's probably the top comment I get is I'm convinced because of a near death experience, which is, you know, as Matt said, like aside from the, the logic and the scientific part, just, just zoom out and, and think about it from a philosophical approach a little bit. We're meaning seeking machines and something happened that is abnormal. People don't almost die every day. You didn't die. So you don't know what's on the other side. There, it, it's not like a, a chasm opened up. You were still completely here. And it's, um, it's just a failure 
of imagination for all the other spiritual experiences that one can have, whether it's psilocybin or an orgasm or any of the other things that we have been able to label better than near-death experience. You know, even calling it NDEs just leads it to this realm of the unknown and the possible and the potential. No, like we give it a term, you know, brain death, orgasm, psilocybin experience, and these are phenomenon that we know we can have, and none of them ever align up with each other. You talk to a Hindu, mm -hmm. Buddhist, a Muslim, a Christian, an agnostic, they all have some near-death experience about light, or maybe they even see their God or they see their hell, but it's it's never anything new. You've never been revealed particular information that was once unreachable that now you have that is uh, verifiable. Like So in the realm of missing all of that, call it what it is, man. It was a crazy experience. I'm sure it felt powerful. I'm sure it has significance in your life. But there's no reason to believe, like Matt said, if there's no follow-up that any God actually wanted to communicate anything in particular. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think in the vacuum of anything else, to look at at that time pragmatically it, it just fell upon this oh it was greater than you know this reality experience so i did just want to get your points of view on that and uh, appreciate it no worries man and do, do if you get a chance definitely reach out to recovering from religion because um Oh, really? And that, that secular therapy project, there are people out there, you know, I mean, if you've got a lot of baggage to, to, to unpack, to, to talk through it, oh, yeah. I, I wish we had the, the, the time to do that on a show, but also yeah. I'm not qualified yeah. for that. Um, and so sure. it's, it's but better what was to talk that to some again? people. Recovering from religion.org and secular therapy. Thank you so much. .org. My pleasure. Thanks, John. Thank you. All right. Take care. Whoop. After the thank you, I was clicking the thing, dog on it. Um, yeah, as a reminder, once uh, we, we're getting ready to take the, the last call for today, um, thoroughly enjoyed having Brandon on here and everything else, but uh, we read all the Super Chats over $10 on this show right after this is over with. So if you want to get near the, the front of the line on those uh, and make sure that Brandon is here to answer some of them, uh, you're going to want to get those in now. Plus, I think Jimmy will probably take a bat to me if I don't at least promote Super Chats once during the show. So there's your once. Uh, somebody got mad the other day. I I'm the guy who constantly forgets to ever mention his Patreon. My my YouTube channel, my personal YouTube channel is finally monetized, but I still haven't made a penny off of it because I haven't finished the the paperwork to get them to actually send me money. I've been at YouTube, 180,000 subscribers, give or take, and and didn't didn't monetize that. I keep forgetting to tell people to go to the Patreon, which is my primary way of uh, of making money. I do it one, and somebody jumps in and is like, of course, they're going to be like, we've got a Patreon, give us money, you e-beggars. I have a real job. And Jimmy, of course, posts posted on threads and i'm like god i mentioned it once and all of a sudden it's just too much so give me all your money damn it give me get over to my patreon.com slash atheist debates that's where you're going to find not only the debates i do but you're also going to find uh, my debate reviews there as well as content information on a number of different topics and epistemology you can get in for as little as a dollar a month i'm going to start advertising my patreon at some point in every show just to piss off that one person who thinks it's just a bridge too far for me to actually get paid for the massive amount of work that i do producing multiple shows and countless debates over a couple of decades in the meantime though we'll get to super chats right after this next call that was a great ad that was great i love having fun like that it's a is it it's either callum or calum from scotland um please correct my pronunciation a polytheist that has a question about uh, a call that apologia and i took so welcome sir how how should i pronounce your name hello Well, it's either Callum or Calum. I think it's Callum. Um, a polytheist from Scotland. And what it says here is that Paul G and Matt took a call with the question, did Jesus exist? Are you there now? Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? I, I can. If you can tell me how to pronounce your name and then ask your question, we're ready for you. Thank you for waiting. Fantastic. Sorry to keep you waiting, guys. Um, yeah, it's Callum. Callum. Well played, sir. 
Yeah. How can we help? Um, first of all, great to speak to you both. I love uh, what you do, both of you. Um, really enjoy your stuff. But yeah, let's get on to the thing I rang about. Um, you may not remember, Matt, but you and Paul Gia took a call back on the 29th of May entitled, How Can You Say Jesus Existed? And I felt like, now, first of all, you started off by saying, I don't believe Jesus performed any miracles. I'm not even convinced that he existed. So kudos to you. I fully agree with that. However, I felt like the rest of the answers that you and Paul gave sounded like the kind of answers that theists, particularly Christians, give to the sorts of challenges that atheists give. Um, okay. So I wanted I need, to address some example. of the things you said. Yeah, yeah, cool. All right, so um, let's start with the last thing you said, which is, you said, I don't think you have to go to Jesus as a myth to demonstrate that Christianity has a problem. Now, that's true as far as it goes. Christianity has many problems, as both of you know, but wouldn't you, I feel like I'm echoing you back to yourself, Matt, because wouldn't you rather look at the evidence and try and find out what the truth of the matter actually is, rather than just saying, we don't need that? Yes. I see, you haven't, you haven't identified anything that I've said so far that is remotely incorrect. My, pison, my position is, yep. I'm not... I'm not even necessarily convinced that Jesus existed, but asserting that he did not exist is a, is a position that has a burden of proof that I don't think can be yeah. met. So rather than claiming that I've falsified the unfalsifiable, my position is, and, and I, I also, as I said, I don't think you need to go all the way to Jesus was a myth in order to address problems in Christianity, which you agreed with. So can we get to whatever I said that you think was wrong? Hello? Brandon, are you still there? I'm still here. Sorry. All right. Well, Callum's evidently not. At least he had a nice accent. I kind of I kind of get what he's saying. It just it's unnecessary. In lieu of not being able to prove or not prove that he's there, who cares? Because it's still not beneficial. Like I think that was your point from yeah. what I'm gathering. And uh it needs no more investigation because you can't investigate anymore. We just, we have the tools we have. We have the knowledge we have. That's it. Yeah. It's funny that he says that I gave answers that sounded like what a Christian would say. I don't know too many Christians that would, that are likely to say they're not convinced that Jesus existed. See, this is, there's a difference between not being convinced that someone is guilty and being convinced that they are innocent. Those are two different things. Like, it, if you look at the blades of grass, it's either even or odd. But if I'm not convinced that the number is even, that doesn't mean that I'm convinced the number is odd. I may not have enough information to reach a conclusion about the two. It's enough of a damning problem for Christianity that Jesus' existence is not one of the most rock-solid, easily confirmable facts in the history of the world. If, it, if Christianity is true, then Jesus' is life, death, and resurrection are all critical components that it would be trivially easy for the all-powerful, all-knowing God of the universe to confirm were undoubtable. That, that, that there was no reasonable way to even say, hang on, did that happen? Not only is it very reasonable to ask, did a resurrection happen? Did this crucifixion happen? did this person exist? Because if you list all of the facts that we have about Jesus's life, all of the asserted facts and claims, and you take out all the ones that we can't verify, there's virtually nothing left. There may be, in fact, nothing left right down to a name. But to assert that because of that, you can then conclude that this is an invented fiction and the person never existed, is a new position that you have to actually adopt a burden of proof for and make some demonstration of. And I don't know how you do that. I don't know how you say, hey, this is a myth. I understand how you can say um, the myth of Christianity. That I did a whole video on using language like that. Um, but I don't know what answer. So first of all, when, you, when, when he's no longer on the, on the line, so we don't get an answer. 
But when you assert that the answers that Paul and I gave were like those of Christians in some way, you do realize that Christians are capable of telling the truth and making an honest assessment of things, right? Great point. I mean, uh, but if you're only, if you think we're just giving just a little too much uh, aid and comfort to them, I don't know what the fuck you're watching, but I spent 20 years pissing off religious people in predominantly Christians until recently. Now it's the Muslims that are really mad at me uh, at every turn because those guys are some of the worst apologists on the planet and some of the easiest to make look bad because their views, um, like right now, while this, I think while this show is going on, uh, two of my former Christian debate opponents, Mike Jones and David Wood, are together with one of my former co-hosts, uh, apostate prophet Ridvan, going through the debate, or at least part of the debate, that I did with Daniel Hakikachi Saturday. last Saturday. I'm so excited um, to watch that, right by now. the way. I'm, I'm interested to hear what they have to say, because despite the fact that David and Mike and I vehemently disagree on all kinds of stuff, I still am interested in their thoughts on some things, some of them more than other. But yeah, when somebody calls in, they're like, you and Paul took this question, and you seem to be, what I suspect happens is that Callum is a mythicist, and like many of my mythicist friends, is confused as to why I'm not a mythicist. Mm. And that's really easy, yeah. because mythicism adopts a, a position that has a burden of proof that I don't think has been met, and I don't know how it could be met. I'm fine with the notion that Jesus existed. I'm fine with the notion that Jesus did not exist. But if we're going to go after Christianity, I'd rather things that deal with things that are demonstrable and effective. And mythicism is neither the demonstrable nor effective. And so while I don't have a huge problem with the mythicists, I'm not one. I, I don't have a problem with polyamory, but I'm not really polyamorous. It's possible to understand something and still not have it be the thing for you. But as a matter of strategy, I think it's a mistake. Well, All this right. is what I came for. I came for the diatribe. He got you, he got you talking, and that's what I wanted to hear. Well, sweet stuff. We got, um, I got my super chats. We have a handful of them here. We'll crank through these. We'll do them, uh, we'll alternate, I suppose. And I will uh, start it off as long as you can see them. You can take the second one. Get your questions in. 1999 from Greg Markowski. Thanks for the show. Thank you, Greg. You got in first again today. Um, always like when that happens. And uh, much appreciated. Oh, I have, I've forgotten. Oh. Uh, I've been given control of these so that I can pop them up whenever I want. I was just staring at the screen like a, like a dumbass. <laughs> Totally not a demon says the lack of a God belief for me has made me starkly realize just how important the relationship I cherish truly are. Feel you on the rough parent relationship, but often family is forged. Yeah. And, uh, I, I'm a big fan. I have plenty of family that I'm not related to, and I have a number of people that I'm related to that I no longer consider family. And then there's the overlap, um, where there are people who I'm related to who I also consider family. Um, that that's a great thing um that there's someone who the circumstances of reality conspired to put me together with without any intent who i also care deeply for and respect and admire and interact with but if ever that were to change the family that i chose the people who are in my life like arden and jimmy and others that I consider family. Uh, it doesn't matter to me if they were blood relatives. I have two, I have a niece and nephew that they're not blood related to me. They're both adopted. And I couldn't possibly care less about the origin of that. Um, th the very notion that there's something special about a blood relationship is probably a deepity. To the extent that it's true, it's pretty trivial. And to the extent that it's profound, it's probably false. And I will say that maybe fewer people ha know how to really twist the knife uh, better than some blood relatives that you've grown up with. 
but yeah, yeah. But I agree. Choosing your family is a wonderful thing. Yeah, you choose your partner. Anyway, thirteen ninety nine Canadian from D. Stacy's at work. I'm out for dinner, but this is on behalf of the Stacy's Mom podcast. We love the line and everyone involved. Jimmy, go fuck yourself. God, I hate that. <laughs> Ain't D. And yes, as a reminder, um, I'll run through the the uh, the list of shows again real quick. Tomorrow, Transatlantic Collins Show, Car a Arden and Katie are going to be on 2 p.m. Central. Sunday, it's me and Jimmy on the Sunday show. Monday, Skep Talk is Shannon Q with Will McCaffrey. Uh, I don't know what the topic is, but don't tell her at all. But Shannon's been busy with stuff, and I have missed her voice and her thoughts, and I can't wait. Uh, I, I don't always listen to Mondays, or at least not all of it, because I'm busy doing other things on Mondays. And it's nice when Forrest and, and Guts of Kibben are here, because uh, then you're going to get a six-hour show, which means I'm going to get to listen to par part of it. But yeah, I'm looking forward to Shannon. Tuesday's Dying Out Loud with myself and Dave Warnock, and there may or may not be a show next Wednesday. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that it happens, but... We'll let you know. All right. And next. $10 from Jesse Clark. My first introduction to MindShift was yesterday, and I thought Matt would really like this guy. Then in the <laughs> very next video, he said he was doing Matt's show tonight, and I totally freaked out. Jesse, I saw that same comment on my video. So thank you so much for watching both of us and uh, and for the kind support. I hope that hope that we were worthwhile together. $10 for the Raven 200 coming from off the top rope. The troll call about teaching kids about hell was the first thing I heard tuning in. Anyway, I know he isn't here, but Jimmy, go take a destructive death eight layer demon core from Akaza. Oh, and see, I probably didn't pronounce that correctly either. I'm terrible. With I, am bummed you we guys didn't get a talk. I didn't get what? I said, I am bummed. We didn't get to talk uh, about the hell issue because I think it's an interesting point, yeah. but that guy was obviously not here for it well I, it'd be real easy uh let's find another wednesday or sunday or whenever when you've got time in your schedule we'll do this again we'll get some more calls and we'll also talk about the health thing because i was i'm like you i was more excited about that call and not not for the reason some people think like i know dawkins has referred to the doctrine of hell as child abuse and a number of other things and i think he's right but I also have this uh, concern about running around labeling things as child abuse because it's not all cut from the same cloth. And um, learning something that your parents honestly believe, which may be awful, can be very damaging and problematic and certainly counts as abuse in some sense in my mind, but it's not the same as some others. And in some cases, it might even be worth. I think there's an incredibly interesting conversation to have there. And the fact that that was all just a pretext for a you know, a Baba Booey dipshit. Uh, that that's pathetic. Well, so, I'll take yeah. you up on it because I would love to. Sweet. I know, oh, this one's yours. Uh, from Frankenstein. Always reasonable. Keep it up. Ten dollars. Thank you so much. It's Frankenstein. Oh, of course. Uh, Eleven dollars from XDXC Nitty. Mind shift is making pro content. Great co-hosts. I agree. Thank See, this much. is easy. <laughs> you guys are keeping this simple. I only got like three super chats left. If you had, if you want to get one in, um, we're going to get an early night tonight. If if you guys don't contribute, and and Jimmy might fire me if we don't get at least one more. We have to get at least one more. I'm just saying. Twenty dollars from John Kennel. I was in a near death, almost car wreck the other day and did not invoke the Lord. It didn't even occur. I want a coin or at least a certificate of achievement. <laughs> Good on you. <laughs> oh, we we should get you should get like a little badge or a pen or something for uh, doing that. I I um yeah, I've had some some things where they don't count anywhere near near death experiences. The closest I came to death was when they cut my chest open and worked on my heart. And I it's weird for me. I have a picture of my heart with my, my chest cracked open, my heart is down there, a photograph of it on my refrigerator um, to remind me. And I was one of the first people to ever ask them to do that. And my brother and Arden were, were both here. Um, I think that my surgery and everything about it was rougher on all the other people in my life than it was on me. 
And it reminds me of, of a scenario that happened uh, several years ago. I have no, uh, my ex-wife would be able to, to confirm this story as, as one I've, I've loved and told many times. I don't know if she's watching today or not, but hi. Um, I have, in my early 40s, I had a problem with idiopathic anaphylaxis. And what that essentially means is your body goes into a, an, an allergy style response, like one of the strongest allergy type responses ever, flooding your system with histamine when there's no cause or no known or identifiable cause. It's something that happens uh, quite frequently to men in their 40s. I carried an EpiPen, or not frequently, but more frequently in their 40s than in their 20s and 30s. I carried an EpiPen for a little while. Um, I had an episode where my tongue swole up to fill my entire mouth. And luckily, uh, because I lost consciousness, I regained consciousness on the bathroom floor and realized there was a problem and went and saw my doctor. Uh, shortly after Beth and I got married, or maybe even before we got married, when we were just living together, down, living in sin, um, I realized I was getting ready to have this attack and she was folding laundry. And I said, hey, honey, I need you to stop folding laundry. We have to go to the emergency room right now. I'm getting ready to have an anaphylactic shock attack. And she was like, okay. And I went in the other room to put my shoes on and everything else. And she just kind of kept folding the laundry because I, I think it didn't <laughs> register with her fully. And I walked back in and I was like, we need to go now. And it scared her. And so we get to the hospital and they, they're they putting the cuff and everything on me. And the nurse asked me how I feel. And I said, um, I'm getting ready to pass out. And she said, how do you know that? And that's the last thing I remember until oh, wow. I woke up several hours later and Beth was standing over there, you know, crying and very upset. And I just remember I, I was just, I was just comforting her. I was like, it's okay, honey. It's okay. We're where you go to get better. I, yeah. I'm not panicked anymore. I'd be panicked you if we were at home. Too. That's uh, that's yeah. pretty close. You, you had your own situation. It was, uh, it's good stuff. It's, it's, I'm very grateful for the doctors and I'm hugely grateful to Arden and my brother, uh, and, and the difficulties they went through, because for me, I showed up, I laughed and joked. They put me under anesthesia. I woke up. Uh, I asked the nurse for some ice water when they said I couldn't have any, and I was still intubated or whatever. I flipped them off then I passed back out. And a few hours later, I woke up not remembering that previous thing had happened. And after that, it was a couple of days of hugging a pillow and taking pain meds and then gradually working and rehabilitating. And now I'm probably yeah, 90% of where I was before the heart stuff happened. I'm way better than I was the day before surgery. Mm, I bet. Go science. I think this one's yours, yeah? Yeah. $10 from Click and Var. Glad to see Brandon recently found his channel, and it's great to the first caller, an all-knowing, all-loving, maximally powerful God could and would prevent child sexual assault without violating free will. Yeah. Agreed. I Thank you. $10 from Dylan Fuller. This maybe can be a call, but even the idea of heaven is damaging to kids, myself included. Wanted to die because wanted to just be somewhere better, and it took so long to get out of that mindset. I hear you. I think that's a fantastic topic. I, uh, if, if for those of you who were watching my channel, the video that my biggest video yet is on the seven problems of heaven. And, uh, one of them is that it's not real and the consequences that that has on earthly beings that are trading the here and now for the potential of a promise tomorrow. And especially on kids. Yeah. I think hell gets the bad rap, but I think heaven is very, very problematic. Yeah. There's something about it. There are loads of problems with a concept of hell. There are problems of a concept of heaven and not just for kids. Um, wow. There's too many that for, for us to go through, but the very notion that everything we experience as human beings from the moment our consciousness begins to recognize shapes until the light fades out for the last time, every person we've ever interacted with, every great meal we've ever had, every bit of knowledge we've gained, every aha moment, every orgasm, every moment of love, all of those things are nothing because there's some other life that starts after that that goes on forever and is infinitely better. The very notion, or infinitely worse, the very notion that 
the sum total of everything that we know and everything we've ever experienced is meaningless. Uh, yeah, that is a problem because this is the one and only life we know we're going to get. If there's another one, why, why shouldn't we just treat it as a bonus? It's yeah, it's bizarre. Thanks Dylan. $10 from no idea. Is Jimmy still going to host debates? Yes. We're still doing a number of things like that. Uh, my, we're soon ish. Modern day debates was terrible. And I found Daniel attacking you while James did nothing disturbing. Love today's co-host need to get Jimmy to have Brandon on regularly. Peace. Uh, we're discussing all kinds of things and Brandon's already agreed to come back on. So that's just going to happen. Whether or not he, he ends up being a regular is somebody else is calling a long way down the road of, of evaluating, but yes. So first of all, I get along well with James Koontz from, uh, modern day debates. He, he actually stopped at our house. We went out for lunch. We talked about the plans, uh, for what modern day debates doing. Uh, we had a good visit. We showed him around, introduced him to the reptiles and had a good time. Um, I, I genuinely, I like James and we get along. And that's the, one of the biggest reasons that I've continued to do debates at modern day debates, despite the fact that there are massive problems there. The live chat is a cesspool of the worst order. Um, if you look at the live chat that they saved for that debate and then look at the comments under the actual video, it's like two completely different groups. There's still some bad stuff down in the comments, but the live chat there's a lot of delusional Muslims who not only are they engaged in this machismo garbage that Daniel seems to suck up, uh, but they're, they, they have a fundamental misunderstanding about logical arguments, fallacies, what is reasonable. It is a shame what religion can do to a brain and not just Islam. It's a shame what religion can do to an otherwise healthy, productive thinking mind. Does it impact everybody the same? No. Um, if it did, this is a problem that would have been easily solved ages ago. The reason, the reason generations before me didn't fix the world is because it doesn't hit everybody the same way at the same time. There are absolutely vile, um, Christian ideals, not just within the main orthodox religion but the kkk is an ostensibly christian organization a number of white nationalist groups are ostensibly christian organizations they've picked things out that to me as a southern baptist uh seem like a uh, former southern baptist i'm not one now but they seem like that's a perversion of christianity and in many ways i can see the argument for that but it's undeniable the my favorite question that i asked daniel that night that never got an answer and probably isn't going to, is this. Does Islam encourage terrorist acts, or is it just really bad at preventing its adherents from engaging in them? One of those two things must be true, because there aren't secular humanist terrorists. But thanks a lot, no idea. We'll get on to the rest of these. $10 from Justin. If polytheists love their gods, would that polyamory is that polyamory i guess if so is it still polyamorous even if it's all imaginary love is love right well love is love but if you love somebody who doesn't love you back that's stalking and so if a god doesn't exist it doesn't love you back and then you're just a god stalker oh thanks for the fun justin we have $10 for Rick Walker. Why? Thank you so much, Rick. And by the way, I, I realize I've been, I've been having fun and trying to get through these. Thank you guys so much for, for being here tonight and for every one of these super chats, but not just that. Thanks for participating in chat, both live and after the show in a way that shows that the line community is fundamentally different than some of the other ones. So from Rick Walker, why is the lineage from King David to Jesus contested when the lineage should be God, Mary, Jesus, period? Why is this contested? Okay. Because first of all, Everybody has two parents. And so if you wanted the lineage to be God, Mary, Jesus, that's one parent. Uh, the other parent being Joseph doesn't mean that they sired them. The, the lineage of the family goes down those route. The bigger question is why are there different lineages cited in the gospels and they contradict? That's, that's a bigger question. Did you, how did you deal with that when you discovered it? Me? 
Yeah. I, yeah. The, the different, the different genealogies and them not matching and not making sense. Oh and, man, I heard about it still as a believer and the excuses, you know, I, here's the thing. This is why apologetics is amazing is because they don't have to have a reasonable, good or correct answer. They just have to have an answer so that the believer like me who can look up to someone that knows their Bible more can say someone else said this and it doesn't have to mean anything. And so I held on to uh, so many bad apologetics simply because they allowed me to continue to believe what I wanted and what I was comfortable in believing. So I didn't really deal with these things until I deconverted. And then I was just astounded at myself for being so freaking gullible. That is almost the best phrasing of that for exactly what I described back at the beginning of the show. When I went to my uncle for an answer, he gave me an answer and without any thought, of course, that's the thing. And I just went off. You are, yeah. you are taught religions and Christianity in particular are incredibly good at creating a protective mental barrier around that belief such that the top-down authoritarian view that you were just describing of your preacher knows more the person who went to bible college knows more it is all how do you, you can't question god yeah how dare you you really shouldn't question your preacher um you shouldn't question your parents and I think all of those lessons, I think the world would be dramatically different if we taught people how to not only question their parents, authorities, ministers, and God, but to do so in a respectful and productive way that isn't just viewed as, you know, I'm going to be rebellious, screw you, I don't need to do what you say. But what I mostly care about is the truth. Is it possible that you think you have the truth, but you don't? And anybody who says it's not possible, they need to be questioned even more. Yeah. Yeah. And that's on top of all the other horrendous indoctrination methods of guilting you. You know, most, most pastors and priests will say, yeah, question, bring the questions. That's good. You should have your series of doubting. That's how you know you're drawing close to the Lord. But they, they mean it to an extent. They mean it until it becomes too problematic or you realize right. too much. And, it's um it's just it's such a false vote for critical thinking from them and uh it's it really irks me very much i'm with you is this one me or you what are we on this one's you okay ten dollars from the raven 200 again thank you again you almost pronounced it correctly matt what is what is she referencing here you'll know Akaza. Akaza is how it would be pronounced. Jimmy can also take a destructive death, annihilation type from Akaza. Okay, this is from Demon Slayer. This is from Demon Slayer, yeah. I wish I knew more about some of the anime stuff. Um, like, I'm a fan of uh, uh, Akira, obviously, and um, Ghost in the Shell. And mm. for the people who know about, like, old school, um, over-the-top stuff, there was a tentacle porn called Orotsuka Doji Legend of the Overfiend or something that was my first introduction to anything kind of hentai porn animation thing. Um, I remember the name. I couldn't tell you what happened in it. I've, I've, it's not that I hated it. It's this was like so confusing for me coming from a fundamentalist Southern Baptist background to watch this. And I worked so hard to be able to pronounce the name, and I'm probably still getting it wrong, but that's just absolutely wild. $5 from Big Thing, Flying Wayne Thoughts, I, a piece in Thoughts. I tell theists they're atheists to every other God claim. Not perfect, I know, but it gets the point across. What are issues with argument? Um, if I'm understanding you, and you're saying that this is what you tell theists, that you're an atheist to every other God except for the one you believe in, and you want to know what's the, the problem with that particular argument, um, well... I, I think it's probably the, the biggest problem is that they're not going to think of it in that way most of the time, even after explaining it. So I'm not sure how compelling it's going to be. Um, a lot of times the things that we wind up putting on the bumper stickers um, aren't, aren't impactful enough, but everybody's different. Somebody's going to stop believing because you said that. Somebody's yeah. going to stop believing because somebody said, can God make a burrito so hot he can't eat it? Um, the, 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 the mental barriers that religions put up to keep people in there is about not giving them permission to question, 
about giving paying lip service to the truth instead of true service to the truth and people find their way out for different reasons i used to want i used to talk a lot about teaching people logical fallacies the arguments for and against the existence of god the rebuttals to those and that if people came up and said you're just an atheist because you just want to sin that you should say no I'm not an atheist just because I want to sin. I'm an atheist because I did a, a reasoned evaluation of the evidence and found it wanting and blah, 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 blah. And then I realized I was wrong and I did a video. You can go find it on my, yeah, my, my YouTube channel that said Atheist Debates Patreon. I've forgotten now. I can't even advertise it correctly, but it's called Y'all Just Want to Sin. And the point that I wind up making in that video is yeah, there are some people who are atheists because they want to sin, and that's perfectly fine. Because if you're an atheist, because you reject a Christian concept of sin that says that you are sinning and in violation of, of God's perfect order because you're in love with someone of the same gender, that's a perfectly acceptable reason not to be a part of that religion. It's not like they've made a case that they're objectively correct on that moral front. This is their religious view. And there are people who share it who aren't religious, and there are people who reject it who are. But if you're saying, yeah, if you want to call that sin, that's the thing. If you're doing something truly harmful and that's your reason for not believing, that's a problem. But if you're rejecting the concept that what you do and who you are that isn't hurting anybody that's happening between consenting adults is somehow sinful, I think it's a perfectly reasonable reason not to accept a religion. I also think, Matt, tell me if you have found this to be the case. I think it's interesting. Most believers, I think, would prefer that I would be a Muslim over an atheist, because at least I still believe it. At least I'm still coming to grips with there's a creator. All of this is not for nothing. And so that kind of an argument, I think, typically falls really short with those kinds of people who think that way because they just don't see it. They're like, no, I believe in the right one. That's, that's the only thing. And so the idea of an atheist, someone who doesn't believe at all, is so foreign to them that I think most of the time, like Matt says, it won't connect the dots, but something breaks everyone. You know what broke me the most was a non-stamp collector YouTube cartoon about Noah's Ark. It blew my fundamentalist mind wide open, and it's embarrassing to say that, but it was one of the, the first huge cracks that made me go, well, shoot, maybe this isn't true, at least from the fundamentalist claim. So you never know. Yeah, I think I think it's a good point, and I think that it, it both are going to be true. There are going to be people who, you know, would prefer that you and I were Muslims, and others that prefer they're not. There's a there's a Muslim um, apologist I've, I've talked about recently, actually, who famously said he'd rather argue with an atheist than a Christian. But his his thing was a little bit of a joke because the atheist says there is no God, and the Quran says there is no God but Allah. So atheists are halfway there. They're closer. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and there's a there's a problem that some Muslims have with um, reaching Christians because Christians have have bought into this absolutely nonsensical illogical idea of a Trinity, uh, which is absolutely anathema to to Muslims. But my debate opponent from Saturday said he'd rather live in a Christian nation than a secular humanist one. Um, but my debate opponent from Saturday is a delusional buffoon. Uh, oh no, that's an ad hominem. Yeah, I can do it now because we're not actually debating. Although I did call him like an ass, like in the first 20 minutes, but. Uh, I'm probably going to get the name wrong here. Oh, was it no. me or you? I'm really off no, it's on you. Go here. for it. $10 for from Faran Salas. Theists don't have a problem invoking presuppositions in respect to God and being, and yet balk at the idea of atheist invoking presupposition with the laws of logic and thoughts. Oh, any thoughts. Sorry. Oh. Uh, and no, not um, poorly worded. We're with you. Yeah. No, I. I, I... So there are theists, by the way, who, who presuppose a God for the laws of logic, and then there are th atheists like me who merely presuppose the laws of logic as a practical necessity um, about what can and can't be demonstrated or demonstrated to be inviolate. Um, so yeah, I think it's a little strange that there are the but you're going you're gonna to find this for every, every example you come up with where there's going to be atheist out there that's going to be engaged in some sort of presupposition that that they don't recognize is even that i think i think that's one of the most powerful things that religions have done uh and it did it to to brandon and myself which gave us 
just so stories, just so explanations that everybody here believes it and you'd be a fool to question it. And we have prohibitions against it. And so when, when you're like, Hey, what's the source of morality? Well, obviously it's God. Um, and you don't go any further. Why would you? Once you think you have the right answer, why would you keep looking around for an answer? When I find my car keys, I don't keep looking. That's why they're always in the last place I look because I stop. And, and I think that's what religion does for a lot of these things. And if you begin with the biggest presupposition, that stops you from thinking about anything after that, because anything that comes up that you don't have an explanation for, you now have a presupposed God that can serve as at least the person who has the answers that you don't have. And that's kind of comforting. I don't know, but God knows. $10 from JCMFV. Hi, fellows. I'm a survivor of Evangelical's 90s purity culture. So happy to have my experience validated by the line and all the others. Seth Hemet, et cetera. God bless you all. LOL. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm I still wanting to get Hemet. What's that? I said, I am also a survivor of 90s purity culture. Yeah, I'm a survivor of uh, 80s. Um, the uh uh focus on the family religious right stuff uh the 90s Dr. were Dobson was my uh my guy through puberty because my parents were divorced so my mother played me dr dobson's puberty tapes for my birds and bees talk and i cannot wow. wait to deconstruct that on my channel because it even looking oh back gosh. to what i remember of it it was just terrible terrible advice I never had to, I, I'll have to watch that. Everybody get ready for when he does that video because I'm going to have to watch it because I didn't, I didn't go through that. I actually had a, a pretty good birds and bees talk with my actual parents. Um, but um, yeah, Whew. my nineties were a little bit more freewheeling for me because I graduated in 87 and went in the Navy. And so I was, I was doing things that the, that the younger Christian version of me wouldn't have done. Mm. $20 from Pizzle Main, Mindshift, and Matt. Thank you for helping deconvert more and more day by day. Much love to you and the rest of the community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pizzle Main. $10 from Action Poker. Thanks for the show, Matt. I have heard you discuss four items for judging prophecy, but I can't find them. Can you list them again? Wow. Um, off the top of my head, probably not. There's almost certainly a video about it. If you go to patreon.com slash atheist debates my patreon thing for one mere dollar you can probably go through and find a video that i did on prophecy but i'll tell you all the videos that i do on my patreon are almost all of them. almost every video i do on the patreon they're available to, for free to everybody on my youtube channel um and so if you just search matt delahunty prophecy i think you'll probably find both a youtube video that's part of my atheist debates project and uh, a lecture i gave about it but if I had to try and do it off the top of my head, um, they need to be specific, not prone to interpretation, answerable by a single clear occurrence. And, and the obvious one that I sometimes skip is obviously the prediction has to be in place before the event, and it shouldn't be something that people are actively working to bring about. Because if I say I want a medium rare steak, the, the, the waiter is not fulfilling the prophecy and neither is the, is the cook if I get it medium rare. So that's best I got off the top of my head. Uh, another one here from Action Poker, uh, $10. I asked someone for their best biblical prophecy and they brought up the fall of Babylon in Jeremiah 50, 51. I didn't have a good response, any insight, or should I wait for the secular Bible study? Yeah, we're getting close to uh, Jeremiah, and I'm sure I'll cover it. I don't know if I have a whole lot to say about it right now. There are so many issues in Jeremiah and Isaiah and a few others uh, concerning prophecy. So, Matt, if you have something specific on that one, I'll defer to you. Not only do I not have anything specific on it, um, it's one that I don't think I've actually done a video on, and I don't think I've done anywhere near enough research. Um, to address this particular passage. So I look forward to you doing it. And if you don't get it done soon enough, this will probably dig at my brain until I actually have to, to dig in and do it. That's how most yeah, of my I'm videos happen. Somebody will ask me a question where I don't have a good answer, and then I'll go find one. Or 
I'll find out that it was it was a question. Um, yep. Uh, I just got a note from the producer. We got some more supers r rolling in, and we're very grateful for that. Um, and I only got about 11 minutes or so until I got to let Brandon get out of here. So uh, here's what I'm going to do. Boom. $10 from Eric made a 10. I have nothing to say at this time. Thank you so much, Eric. I'm going to move through these pretty quickly. Uh, I'm going to keep reading these, Brandon, just to save us a little bit of time. $10 from Edward Rogers. Much thanks to Edward Rogers as well. Uh, huge, huge uh, love for the support. And $10 from Jason Henderson just says Deuteronomy. That's for me. I, I, I can't pronounce it. I butchered it on my secular Bible study series, and everyone has not let it go for over two months now. I appreciate that, Jason. Give, give it. Very you want to give it a try? Uh, no. Okay. No. So no, I, uh, I, I appreciate more failure. Arden and I have, have sat around. We watched some videos of, of some people who clearly have done nothing but play World of Warcraft their entire life and haven't right. So they didn't even know how to pronounce like visage uh, as an ability in the game. And it was, I, I forget even now how they, they messed it up, but, uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to mock you, but one of these days, my QE um, seal. Yep. Some people, there's a, there's a tongue tied thing. $10 from the late Peter cook. When I was a child, I feared God may reveal itself to me. So I prayed that it please remain invisible. And to this day, God is still beneath the spell of my prayer. That's outstanding. So, uh, Nicacious, $10 Canadian in alleged money. $10 says tentacle porn will be brought up in Matt's next debate. Why not? In my previous debate, um, they bring up my divorce. Actually, I had a line in my opening that I did not get to use. Uh, I, I, I did not use because of running out of time, and I, I didn't want to add it right at the end. Um, this is going to be happening in, in my opening, and that's this. Every time my opponent, talk, my opponent talks about my personal life, or my personal view, they are avoiding the subject of the debate because I've never taken a debate that is about me and my personal view. So when you want to misgender my girlfriend, when you want to talk about my wife, when you want to mock, as somebody did today, they're like, oh yeah, he's the bad guy, but you got divorced after letting your wife have sex with other people. I'm like, I'm literally advocating for educating children while my opponent is advocating for having sex with them and marrying them, but you decided to focus on my, my marriage and divorce while my ex-wife is still one of my best friends. Do you know how stupid you look right now? It's ridiculous. It's, it's such a good line. Awful. I love that for the beginning of a debate. It, uh, I would hope that it would work, but I also know that it might not. It might not. $10 to the Raven 200. Thank you for the third one. Oh, my goodness. People change their belief for different reasons. I have Dark Matter 2525 to thank for that. A lot of people do. My previous beliefs were satirized, and I didn't have a response for it. It was uncomfortable but needed. Y you are absolutely correct. I'm good company. Um, $10 from Rick Walker. Someone once referred to me as a recovering Catholic. 20 years later, thanks to you and others who do videos like this, I now understand that this is a good description of me now. Uh, thanks. It, yes, I, I fully feel that, uh, except that I wasn't Catholic, although I had family members that were. This is, unless one comes in while I'm reading it, the final Super Chat that we're going to do today, and then I want to wrap all this up. Uh, $10 from Edward Rogers. Matt, I've been trying to learn more about the primacy of reason since it came up in one of your recent debates. I haven't had any luck. Can you point me in the right direction? <sighs> yeah. Um, look, so what you want to look into is I, I always start with David Hume, but it was what I think what you're referencing was, I believe the response was from Thomas Hobbes to Rene Descartes and Rene's cogitor ergo sum was was considered the pinnacle of i think therefore i am the demonstration that if everything else is false there's still a me here that is being deceived and that's undeniable that it must be me and this this was groundbreaking and then hobbes pointed out that that realization is conditional on the primacy of reason and all that's meant there is that that condition that 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 revelation is conditioned on reason being reliable, something that we uh, presuppose and something that we continually demonstrate that it is reliable, but we cannot show that it always will be reliable. We can presume that it is, and it is a reasonable presumption, but everything is conditioned on reason. And so even Descartes' um, 
Cogito showing I must exist is still contingent on reason being reasonable. But you can look into that further there with Hobbes and, and the rest. And uh, of course, somebody sent one in because I bait people. Oh, it's Raven 200. Another $10. You know, if you send in $40 the first time, we'd get more money because I know you're going to send in another 10 after that too. No, I much appreciation to you. And it just says, butts. First of all, huge thank you to you, Brandon, for doing this. I'm, I'm so glad we got to work out the schedule. Um, we should have a link uh, down in the uh, channel description to your channel. But just in case we don't or somebody missed it, tell everybody where they can find you. Yep. The channel name is MindShift. And uh, right there on YouTube, I have absolutely nothing else. I have no Instagram, no Facebook, no Twitter. I was never one for social media. So come to YouTube, YouTube alone, MindShift. That's it. And Matt, thank well, you so huge much. Thank man. you for I, you. Uh, let me, let me say thank you because uh, I'd also be remiss not to mention in the deconversion process, I had a few heroes. You being one of them, Sam Harris, Alex O'Connor, that kind of group was really what brought me into rationality, which fixes everything as soon as you're actually forced to be philosophically consistent. And uh, one of the first things I ever saw was you and, and Mike Winger on if the belief in God is reasonable. And the difference between evidence and claim that you made in that video was another one of those keystone moments for me, man. So thank you, uh, huge fan, very, very proud and happy to be here and uh, appreciate the invite. Well, thank you for saying so, um, but Fucking get over it. We got work to do, and now we're we're working together. Uh, everybody for, tu for for tuning in today. Huge thank you to everybody who contributed, super chats, and everything else. Uh, big love to Arden down the hall doing the producer. To Phoebe uh, for call screening. Uh, to Cookies and Amargan, and I got I killed Earl and every other mom that was in here tonight that I missed out. Uh, tune in tomorrow for the Transatlantic Colin Show. I'll see you guys on Sunday for the Sunday Show with me and Jimmy, and I'll be back again, of course, on Tuesday with Dave Warnock on Dying Out Loud. We're still kind of on hold about Wednesday, but I guarantee you, and this is no BS, uh, unless something stops this from happening, you will see Brandon and I do another show together, hopefully not too long from now. But in the meantime, go check out his channel. Please try to take care of each other as best you can without being a nuisance about it because you don't have to fix everybody. The world isn't on your shoulders, but it's on our shoulders. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Cheers. Also, thanks, thanks to GCMFV for the $10 super chat that came in after we closed out. We appreciate the support. See, the producer's got to get the last word in.